Okay, um, the time is 4.33, and I'd like to call the March 2nd, 2021 study session, Independent School District 622 to order. The first item on our agenda is a uh, WOLD presentation on North High School. So we're excited today, uh, tonight to have uh, Sal with us, um, one of our lead architects uh, in the district uh, doing our projects. Um, we've really enjoyed working with Sal and her staff, and we're excited tonight. Um, we have uh, plans for the North um, addition and renovation for you uh, to see tonight. And so we're excited for you to, to view that. And with that, I, I think what we'll do is we'll let Sal go through the presentation. And then if people have uh, questions at the end, um, we'll have a kind of a question and answer session, okay? That sounds great. Thanks for the intro, Randy. Um, wonderful to see you all again. We're so excited to share what we've been up to in regards to um, the North High School project. Um, preview will be coming back for Tartan, we're thinking probably in May. Um, so we have come to the end of what we call design development at North. And so it's a great moment to share um, all that we've learned from your staff and your teachers on what they want to see in their spaces. We also do have some 3D views of what the, both the outside and the inside of the building are proposed to look like. So with that, I'll get started. Um, so just to remind everyone and those who might be watching at home what the project scope is, um, it's about a $21 million project or construction cost project um, to increase the capacity of the building to serve 1800 students. There's additions and renovations allocated for the media center, various classrooms and labs and special education. There's a part of the project to create a secure entry and some main office renovations that go along with that. Um, and then there's some maintenance work that's being paired along with the, um, I'm gonna call them educational adequacy improvements, including replacement of the better part of um, one of the exterior materials, it's called EFS. Um, it's a, essentially a stucco finish that is um, come to the end of its life. So you'll see some exterior renderings for that. Referendum goals was to provide a safe and secure environment for students across the district, making sure that both high schools have an equitable capacity for your planned enrollment and uh, up to 1800 each, uh, making sure that there's equitable student experiences across both high schools, and last but not least, creating flexible and innovative teaching and learning spaces. I'm not going to go through all of these, but as a part of the uh, planning process, we gathered a core planning group for both North and Tartan, they actually started their meetings together. So we had a few kind of combined meetings uh, to set vision and mission to make sure that there's equity and um, a holistic experience, no matter where in the district somebody goes to school. But then we broke into separate groups to talk about the details of what it means for each building. We've highlighted in orange here some of the key concepts, including maximizing flexibility, being safe while being welcoming, making sure there's opportunities for collaboration and a desire for flexible learning spaces really wherever we could find them. Um, as well as an improvement in natural daylighting. Talked about the role that the media center plays in the building um, and how this transformation can really help it be a learning commons and um, support a variety of functions and provide a variety of spaces for small group, large group and individuals um, and what types of hours that it might keep and what needs to be secured when, et cetera. Talk about that the main entrance needs to be easy to find for visitors and follow the district standards for secure entries. Um, and that there needs to be a variety of seating options for students. And then when we come to design criteria, so these are some of the rules of the design that the core planning group helped set for us. We talked about the media center needing to be accessible to students and the community outside of class times to provide a variety of breakout spaces for independent study and learning. And that's important that those have visual connection for supervision, um, that all restrooms being either created or touched will be gender neutral as a district standard. Um, college and Career Center being near the Media Center and visible to students and that we should be thinking about any future expansion beyond this project. Uh, talked about that flexible learning spaces need to have increased visibility for supervision and safety. And so you'll see in the floor plans coming up uh, the class, the design of the classroom additions, but we talked about classrooms directly near those flexible learning areas should have the opportunity to have a physical connection. Um, so we reviewed, you know, at the elementary schools, what decisions those core groups made, what decisions were made at the middle school level, and so the high schools could make um, decisions that once all of this work is done in the district, your students will have a holistic experience on what their classrooms to resource area interaction looks like. Um, and that we need to make sure that the classrooms allow for flexible learning amongst mul multiple styles. Talked about making sure there's staff spaces distributed out through the building. 
Um, and then some, some details, but really important details. So making sure that there were spaces for mental health, mindfulness, prayer, et cetera, um, as well as a parenting space for nursing mothers on your staff. Um, and then some criteria about how SPED should be distributed throughout the building. So our cluster programs should be centrally located while the core group had a strong desire to make sure resource rooms are distributed near general education classrooms. Here's an overview of the site. Um, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it, but just called out um, 11th Avenue, Highway 36, and where the main entry to the building as well as the receiving. Um, here's a, a Google Earth view of that as well, just to familiarize people. So staff and visitor parking is currently on the east, student parking on the west, and then there's kind of a blend of student and staff parking to the south. Uh, and then just how the existing building lays out. So for those who might not be familiar, you actually enter this building on the second floor by the main office up here. Um, and then there are portions of the building that are three stories. Also on this first floor are cafeteria, auditorium, music, and some classrooms. And if you go down to first floor, there's language arts, world language, facts, gymnasiums, locker rooms, the forum room. And then last but not least up on third floor is the science department, math and language arts. So that's the current layout. Um, here, we will zoom into each area, but here's the uh, proposed layout at the end of the core planning group and all of the user groups work. Um, so we've talked about it at our other updates, but we've spent the past several months meeting with the proposed users of these spaces to get the details right. Jen has been a huge help in that. She's sat in a lot of meetings with us in the past couple of months. Um, but so we'll, so here's the main entry. So there's a small addition here to create a secure vestibule to meet your standards and some rearrangement inside the main office to make those relationships make sense. There's renovation of the media center right here. And then here is the classroom addition. The core planning group weighed pretty heavily where to plug additional classrooms onto the building. And they felt that this was the most stitched into the academic heart of the building. So there's a three-story classroom addition here. Um, first and second floor are general classrooms and then third floor are labs so that that stitches into the rest of the science department. Here's down on first floor, like I mentioned. So first floor is again, uh, additional classrooms and a flexible learning area. And then last but not least up on third floor, three additional science labs with their own flexible learning area. We've also, um, oops, one more, um, created a flexible learning area on the, wet, the east side of the third floor. Um, we talked about how the media center can really serve for that um, for other floors, but that um, third floor was a little bit far for that. These are some pictures of the existing building, which we used um, in as we developed our material and color palettes as the building is not being uh, completely renovated, um, but obviously some major spaces are being transformed. So wanna make sure what we propose um, is, I'm gonna call it harmonious with, what, with what's there, but also sets a new standard for how you can um, keep updating the building going forward. So here's the atrium that many people talk about. This is what the existing media center looks like, um, a typical existing hallway, and then the commons. Just to jog memories, it's probably been a while since you've been in there. Um, and then again, so this is what the existing materials are. I'm just gonna flash to um, our proposed materials. So what we've done over the past about month is work with um, Kevin and a few members of his administrative team um, Kevin, or, uh, uh, Mike, Randy, and Jenna um, to talk about what the new material palette should look like. Um, so we've got a proposed paint palette here. So a field white paint and then a couple of accent colors. And one thing we worked really closely with them to try to strike is the balance between, like I said, respecting the previous color palette, um, acknowledging that it is a high school and that school spirit is important, um, but not going too over the top with the school spirit in the academic areas. Um, and we also did draw on John Glenn for inspiration too, knowing that there's a pathway there. Um, so in addition to those paint colors, there's some, a variety of wood accents to bring some warmth, warmth to the color palette. I was gonna actually mention it when we were back on this photo, but um, there's actually a lot of angles in the architecture of North, whether it's in the ceiling elements and the floor plan in the walls, et cetera. Um, and so we kind of built upon that in this proposed carpet. So it's got similar color tones to the paint um, but bring some of those angles back in. And then we had some requests for intentional display of student work. Um, so making sure that we, we know that there's gonna be a lot of things wanna be hung up and celebrated. Um, let's make a meaningful home for that. So we've got a variety of tack board areas. Um, and then last but not least, some tiles for both in the bathrooms and protecting the walls and some resilient flooring. 
So here's a zoomed in view of both the lower and main level classroom additions. You can see a little bit better here. So we've got a series of classrooms around a flexible learning area here per the core planning groups criteria, all of the classrooms. So these four right here that directly front onto that flex learning area have an operable glass set of double barn doors so that they can physically break out. Um, all classrooms have visibility via glass near their door. Um, and then there's a small flex area here and a couple small group rooms. So whether a, a breakout conference room and then a space designed for prayer and mindfulness, presence of special education resource in all academic areas of the building. Um, and then last but not least, some bathrooms. So this is what it looks like on both lower and main level. This is our final floor plan after user groups. Um, this is one of those axon diagrams. So it's kind of like we peeled off the roof or the ceiling and we're looking down into it just to help explain some of the relationships. So we've got those classrooms around this flexible learning area. These are those sliding glass barn doors and these four classrooms that front onto that. Um, I maybe should have mentioned on the last slide actually, but um, so the existing building ends right here on this dash line. Um, but there is another line that's shown better on this axon um, that says storm shelter line. So as a part of the building code last spring was adopted that new square footage in school facilities um, needs to comply with a, a certain part of the code. So that's a new change. It was not required in part of any, I don't think any of the other referendum projects to date because of the timing, um, but um, essentially we have to make sure that there's a space inside the building that can withstand the effects of an F5 tornado. Um, so that's significant for wind, um, wind speeds, roof uplift, um, things like that. So any glazing we propose has to have shutters on it so that a projectile can go through it in a tornado. Um, so actually the storm shelter itself ends at this line right here. Um, and then the, the existing building ends here. So that's been a, an engineering complexity we've had some fun dealing with, but um, so Knowing that that's what the first and second floor floor plan looks like, I'm going to go through a few um, 3D views. In all of these, there is a, we call them a key plan in the bottom left corner. So it shows you the floor plan and then an arrow that tells you where you're standing. So we're standing basically right at the edge of the existing building. The two classrooms to our right are actually inside the existing building being renovated to face out to this flexible learning area. Um, and then there's, a flex, there's classrooms all around it. And here's this flexible learning area. You can see um, to kind of defining this with the use of the um, red accent color, bringing in some warmth with the wood, the group really, um, that really resonated with them. The furniture is certainly just a, a draft at this time. We'll work with the district on your furniture standards there, but um, it was really important to the users in the design of the space, like I said, for intentional spaces for student work. So these kind of angular shapes are actually tack surfaces, um, as well as a significant amount of access to marker board. We talked about that for, um, things like AVID, really wanting to make sure that there's lots of writable surfaces. So we're make, putting everything to work. Um, so here's this view. And then I think if I go down, um, now we're standing in the hallway. So the new classrooms are on our right now. And we're looking into that flexible learning area from the main circulation. Um, so these are those existing classrooms that will get those operable glass barn doors looking into the flex space trying to define what circulation with hard surface versus what's a space to pause and do our work with carpet. Um, and again, making sure that there's spaces for individuals, small group and large group. Um, now there's a, now we're at the Northern part of the floor plan. So we've kind of walked down the hallway and gone around the corner. Um, so this is a small flexible learning area that's at the very Northern part of the addition with a small group breakout room. Um, at the end of this hallway, so you can see through these doors would be the staircase that connects those three stories together. And again, the existing building would be kind of right behind us here. A couple other things you can see in this view, having tile up to four feet to protect our walls. Um, and again, using our, our accent colors that are um, kind of subtle uses of school colors. Uh, and then last but not least, a zoomed in floor plan of our upper level. So this is where we have our three additional science labs. Um, and they also have a flexible learning area. Major difference here is um, the presence of a few science prep rooms. Um, so these two rooms share a space, these two rooms share one, and then last but not least, one for this lab. There are still restrooms up on this floor and some flexible learning area. Uh, same idea here. So the dashed white line is where the storm shelter extents would end and the dashed black line is where the current 
existing building ends. And just an axon view to help explain that. Um, now we're going to move into the media center. Um, so the core planning group really, as you saw in some of the criteria and commitments, they wanted to make sure that this space was as flexible and accessible as possible. Um, so one thing that they chose to do, I might actually just highlight it here, um, was to include an operable partition here that can stack against this wall over here um, so that during the day it could be as open as possible. Um, same thing here, that these doors could be open during the day, but that you could secure so that you have choices. Um, and then rearranging the media center to better support the functions that the core planning group was looking for. So we've got a variety of small group and medium group breakout rooms here on the perimeter with lots of transparency into them for supervision. We've got a couple built-in counters for individual work and some computers for even uh, community access. Um, a large open area for both small and individual group work, as well as being able to do a big presentation here. So we've got a presentation wall in the south here, and we've um, worked with the users to make sure that the space can hold the meetings they've talked about. And then last but not least, making sure that we have space for the book collection. So um, the color definition makes it look like there's walls here, but um, it's actually intended to be um, very open. So we've got our media desk here. There are operable walls that can enclose this space, but the intent is that it's uh, free flowing with the media center most of the day. You'll see that in the 3D views. There we go. Uh, so here's one of those axon diagrams of the media center explaining those relationships. So you can see our small group breakout spaces here and here with their transparency, our couple built in individual work areas. Here's that centrally located media desk with good sight lines over all of the space, um, space for your book collection here. And then you can see the operable walls are shown in the uh, open position here. So they're stacked up against the wall and free flowing. Um, and then that large group presentation space. Um, and then this is just showing what that space would look like in a large presentation or meeting arrangement because that was important. Um, so a couple 3D views of that. So we have just, we're kind of standing or walking out of the hallway um, in that uh, area where the core planning group wanted to open up the media center. In the distance, we can see the media desk and the um, book collection behind that. Um, we've got some of those same, I'm going to call them architectural features to define small and individual work zones, the wood ceilings to bring some warmth some marker board surfaces, uh, flex furniture. We've got a couple built-in counters for individual work. And then you can see one of those breakout rooms, um, highly transparent for good supervision. Now we've kind of stepped into the main area. The um, circulation desk would be right behind us. We were just over here. So here's the main hallway. Here's another one of those built-in counters with computers. Um, and then this is that large group area. And I think um, last but not least, now we're basically sitting at the circulation desk looking at the large group zone. So it's set up in kind of a flex furniture, um, you know, everybody working in small groups around their own uh, arrangement. But if you wanted to have a meeting in here, there's a large presentation opportunity here and then you could set up rows of chairs and fit about 140 people. And here's what that would look like. We're kind of sitting towards the back row. but. Uh, and the main entry. So um, there's a small addition here, um, both to accommodate the needs for a weather vestibule and then a secure vestibule, as well as to also make the entry a little bit more apparent to visitors when they approach the building. So um, what's in black here is new square footage. And then once it turns to gray, those are existing walls. So you walk in the weather vestibule, are permitted to the secure vestibule. There is a window and counter to interact, um, get checked in and then doors to the school. There is also a door to the main office and then there's some rearrangement in here. Um, so we've got our welcome desk, a couple other um, workstations planned for. And then you'll see in the 3D, we've spent a lot of time with the site talking about, you know, this is many people's first and maybe only introduction to the building or they might only come as far as this. So it was really important to them to have branding and identity as a part of the architecture here. Here's just one of those axon diagrams again explaining. We had to do a little bit of rearrangement um, to create a couple AP spaces as a result of this. Um, so this is a view we're standing inside the secure vestibule kind of at that window or counter. Um, 
at that, that greeting or welcome station. So making sure that there's some branding here, um, going a little bit stronger with the school colors while still um, having some warmth and elegance. There was a lot of talk about um, elevating the experience for students. Uh, now we've stepped inside the main office, so our business must have taken us inside the main office. The welcome desk is behind us. So we've got those couple workstations um, calling attention to that work area with um, school colors and one of these linear strip lights, as well as a um, feature wall with that wood material and some signage. Just another view of that. So this is what students would see when they come into the main office from the door to the hallway. And then last but not least, we're sitting in a waiting chair. Um, our desks are on our left. You can see the door students would come in on our right here and the vestibules in the distance. And then here's that um, welcome desk in the distance and the principal's office. Um, so now we're gonna step outside. Um, we're working through all of this with the district and the city, but um, there's gonna be some um, reconstruction of pavement areas to make sure that we can get um, the right condition as well as good traffic flow and function. Um, but we've got our small addition for main entry here, and then here's our three-story classroom addition. Here's what that looks like, just added on to that Google Earth view. So again, a three-story classroom addition on the west side. It's difficult to see the main entry in this angle, but we do have a series of exterior views to show you um, what both the new square footage will look like, as well as what the replacement of the EFS material will look like. So these are some existing photos just to explain to people um, the EFS. Um, is the exterior insulated finish system. Um, so that's this material here. It's kind of the tan. Um, and it's a material that has to be uh, maintained or replaced. And it is difficult once it gets damaged to do that. Um, so holes can get dug in it, et cetera. Um, so after a lot of discussion, I think the, the preference um, would be to go to a, a material that's a little bit more durable and easy to maintain long term. Um, and I think that provides the opportunity to modernize the building quite a bit. So we're actually proposing for the most of that space to be replaced with metal panel. So, and then just to jog memories, this is what the existing main entrance and athletics entrance look like. Um, so proposed materials, the existing, all of the existing brick is staying, um, but we are replacing the existing EFs with um, two different colors of metal panels, kind of a, um, a bone white that's got a subtle shimmer to it. We call that a mica. Um, as well as some dark charcoal. And then we are matching the existing brick as well as in select key areas proposing a darker brick that would match this metal panel color. So here we call these bird's eye views. That's kind of an impossible view, but we're, we're flying by. Um, so just to orient you, the main entrance is right here. Here's your existing classroom area. This is the fly loft of your auditorium. So that's a big volume you're probably familiar with. And then way down here would be the classroom edition. Um, so here's where that new square footage um, draws a lot of attention to the main entry. You'll see in a zoomed in view in a little bit, but um, adding a lot of glass here and making it a little bit taller than one story and uh, using a different material um, to call attention to it. Taking advantage of that large mass of the auditorium fly loft for some branding. Um, exact lettering and locations, kind of final or TBD, but um, we have reviewed this with the site. And then on the whole, replacing a lot of that um, EFS material um, with metal panel, um, but calling attention to there's some very special moments in the building's floor plan um, at staircases and a few other places you can see in the window pattern. So we're proposing featuring those with the dark brick and metal panel. So there's a series of them on the classroom, as well as at our connection space and on the back side, there we go, back side. Um, so we've got another one of those special moments in the addition. Um, so it's more tightly placed windows. Um, and then there's one of those right here, which is at another one of those exit stairs. Also using that feature material to call attention to the athletic entrance, just like at the main entrance. Um, so we have a few views from down on the ground. Um, so here we are standing um, looking at the main entry. Um, so the only new square footage here is actually, you know, this mass right here. But I think through um, that very small amount of square footage, as well as the recladding, it really makes it um, very apparent where the main entrance is, where right now it's kind of in a, in a nook or a notch of the floor plan. Um, and the replacement of that east, like I said, brings the opportunity to modernize the facade quite a bit. 
Um, we made a note here that final logo still needs to be determined, but a placeholder for now. Um, we'll step around the building and then this is an existing photo just for comparison. Um, just getting a little bit closer as we walk up. You know, one thing that's kind of unique about the building right now is that the doors are at an angle to somebody approaching. So I'll highlight that down here. Um, so you walk underneath the covered area and then the doors are at an angle and by straightening out the floor plan a little bit, we think that that makes that approach slightly more contiguous or um, going to the back part of the building. So the media center is above the athletic entrance here. And again, trying to um, make that very apparent. It's already something that's happening. So formalizing that, including a little bit of signage and again, calling attention to it with that special material. Another view of that. And then our classroom volume. So um, this right here is the existing outside corner of the building. So everything from there this way is the addition. Um, so we are um, kind of honoring the placement and spacing of the windows that the existing building has along that northern facade, um, but introducing a little bit more of that dark material um, and playing on the, the volumetric nature of the building with some of these L-shaped masses. So having the white metal panel interact with the brick at an L. Um, so these are the windows I mentioned that um, will have to be, have shutters on the inside due to the storm shelter code. But we're proposing doing metal panel between them to mimic the look of two-story glass. And I think, oh, I thought I had one more, but I guess that's it. So um, with that, maybe I'll cover just a little bit about schedule. Like I mentioned, we're at the end of design development. So we've completed the user group process. We've had a series of meetings with the site about um, what both the inside and the outside of the building um, look like and need to function like. Um, and I guess with that, I'd take any comments or questions or Mike, Randy, Jenna, anything from you all? You've been there every step of the way. I would just say, I think it's super exciting. I'm excited to kind of hear the board's reaction to this. Um, I think it. I think the school looks amazing and looks like a wonderful update and hits on all the things that we promised in our referendum. But I'm curious to hear what board members think and their reactions. I, I agree with uh, Jenna and it's been a, a real transparent open process, a lot of participation with staff. And I think uh, the WOLD team did an amazing job uh, facilitating that. Uh, I know it's not only it's not always easy. So uh, kudos to them for that. And I, I, I too think it's a it's a great product at this point in time. So we're excited to hear what you have to say about it. All right. Do we have questions or comments from board members? I have a, just an observation. Will there still be that? I didn't quite pay attention, I guess, during the, the presentation about the traffic flow, but all that congestion around the front entrance now with a bus drop off and the parents drop off and all that stuff and, and everything with that intersection right in front of the front entrance, will that all be gone or, or guided in a different direction with the new building? We're, we're working on that right now with the city. Um, and again, there's not a lot of options here because it's such a small parcel, but yeah, I think we have a solution um, to separate some of this um, congestion. Uh, now we are gonna leave the buses, the regular school buses on 7th. We, we did get approval from St. Paul, North St. Paul to do that. Uh, it just makes the most sense uh, for safety, et cetera. Um, and then um, we've changed the, the uh, parent pickup and I don't know, do you, did you have that slide, Sally? That was in the- I think the, it got developed after this got submitted into the board uh, packet. That's so in the west side pickup. of the building, right? The new parent pickup? Um, no, actually, I think we- On the east we, side. It's on the, it's gonna be on the east side now. So it's gonna be between the arena uh, and the front of the building. I can go to the existing site plan. But... And then um, parent pickup is going to be on the west side, is that, that's right, Mike, right? It's on the west side for parent pickup, correct. Yep. Thank you, got it. Good question. Uh-oh. So that, right, has, anything else? that has been one of our challenges, to be honest with you. And so I think, I think we have a good solution, obviously a much better one than we do 
uh, than we currently have. So, um, you know, we will be meeting with the, uh, you know, with the city of, of North St. Paul here and uh, as part of our conditional use permit planning also. Is there, will this, will there be enough room to um, accommodate the students that have to go to the district center? Yes. Yeah, okay. that was one of the rationale for the, for the um, addition, et cetera, and, and just breakout spaces, et cetera. So um, I know we're saying capacity is 1800, but I know, you know, if push came to shove, we can, you know, we can, we can fit a few more kids into the building. <laughs> so I could eight, eight, add eight, to what Randy just said. Yeah, we are definitely looking at not having kids walking through the rain and yeah. cold to the DEC and anymore. <laughs> we're still going to have to do that while we're staging the construction, but the goal is to take um, all student learning out of uh, the DEC, um, at least on third floor. So there might be some separate programs that, that will be um, like downstairs. Uh, I know Next Step has is using the, the, the printing facility now, et cetera. But as far as um, main student education, we'll all be moved to um, North High. I'll just throw in too, I, I like uh, the little detail that some of the design elements um, mirror what's going on at John Glenn. I think that's a cool little touch for continuity. Yeah, I think I think that was a sales point there. Don't you think so, Sal? <laughs> we, we, we combined some of Walt's um, color palette, proposed color palette, then with some of John Glenn's already accepted color palette and it just, it, it, uh, it was uh, widely um, received. Yeah, I think it's, um, we've hit a really nice point of going, um, you know, it's not exactly the same thing, but I think the student experience will feel consistent between grades six, 12 then. All right, any other questions or comments? I just wanted to say that your renderings of the building are really clean and they look fabulous as you know a student is approaching a newer building like to me they would be excited to go into something new with the color palettes I really appreciate that and that the planning teams made the media center and the flexible learning they made them very intentional to allow for that space whether it's individual, medium, or large group. And I think that's really important because if anyone's going into any type of secondary college setting, they're seeing a very similar layout. And so that kind of sets them up for what that may look like when they go to the next step. Absolutely. And that was a high priority of the group. We actually spent a lot of time talking about collegiate environments in the core planning group. And um, even talking about like the feel of a student union for the media center, for lack of a better term. All right. Um, I think this looks great. It's super exciting for North High. Um, you know, I did have one question. It was about the security features. And I think I asked you guys on the other buildings too, but just those ideas about like the double vestibule vestibule when you walk in and some of the other ways of shutting down the buildings so that like if kids are coming in for athletics that they can't enter the full building you know those kinds of things that we have in the other buildings that are being updated sure let me bring I think an overall floor plan might be the best slide for that um okay so um, we've got our, our weather and secure vestibule. So that's weather and secure vestibule. Um, and then there are a series of cross corridor doors that can be taken advantage of. So um, there's doors here, the media center will have a door. Um, most of the wings have doors like here and here. Um, I think you can kind of choose how open you want. Usually the cafeteria is open if there's things happening, but um, so essentially the, the group worked to make sure that the academic areas can be sealed off while your more public spaces, cafeteria, auditorium, gyms can be accessed. I don't know, Mike or Randy, any other thoughts on that? No, it was a high priority of the site. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, that's uh, great. Yeah. 
we're, we're good. That's exactly it, Sal. We just want to make sure yeah, that that's yeah. good. Thank you, Sal. Yeah, I could add on a point as well, I, if I could, Michelle. I just wanted to say some, sing some praises for Wold and Sal and um, Vaughn. The whole team has just been incredible. And one one of the things that's been most amazing about their leadership has been the communication. They've involved students, they've involved staff. Um, everyone has had who lives and works in these spaces has really had some voice there, and it's been really incredible to see how well they've put that together. So, can never say enough great things about the way they're communicating. Oh, thank you. We appreciate that. And Vaughn wishes he could be here, but somehow him and Kaylin both decided to go to Florida this week and nobody gave me the memo. So, <laughs> <laughs> Spring break. Right. Well, we appreciate Any the other? time tonight. I, it's wonderful to give you an update. And like I said, I think we'll have a similar update um, in, the, in the coming months uh, for Tartan. All right, thank you very much. Thanks to the whole team who worked on that. Wonderful. Well, have a great rest of your work study meeting. See you. Thanks, Elle. Thank you. Thanks, Jenna. All right. So next on our agenda, we have the capital budget and Randy. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here and hopefully here. You'll be able to uh, whoops. Uh, are you seeing the full screen? Or are you seeing the two? We're seeing the two, Randy. Okay, I need to stop that then. I've got a double monitor here, so I've got to <laughs> take that into consideration here. Oh boy, somehow, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm having some technological difficulties here. All right, there we go. Did that come up or not? No. Yes. We're yep. seeing the no, we're seeing the did. slide. We're seeing the slides on your left as well, but it's okay if we need to go from there, Randy. Okay. So I guess what I want to do how's how how's that looking? Let's there go. you go. Bingo. Okay. <laughs> All right. I had the double monitors going here, and it it took a little bit to to get used to it. So um, again, uh, we're starting. We're going through our. Um, you know, our budget for 2021, our 21, 22. And uh, tonight I just want to give you uh, the first, one of the first steps in the process. Remember we did our certified levy back in December. And so now, um, you know, we're doing um, our uh, recommendation of our capital budget, we do that separately. And then um, I'll go through some of our, our long-term facilities projects. Um, and then kind of where we see ourselves budget wise for next year, uh, some projections. So, um, Again, if, you're, if you take a look at the capital budget, 2021-22, uh, again, building budgets are based upon student enrollment. Again, uh, the allocation is the same we've used in the past. Um, we are using the same student enrollments that we're doing for staffing. Um, other district budgets will remain the same for 2021-22. Uh, there won't be any increases um, as far as um, uh, from an inflation standpoint. Um, the other things just to note, we do have uh, an increase in our in our capital budget because we've had a small increase in lease levy for our 916 uh, facilities uh, that we uh, participate in. Again, we did have, and you'll see here, and I'll point it out, uh, an increase in the Woodbury abatement um, levy. Uh, that was, remember, uh, passed by the board in 2004, 2005, and it has to do with uh, um, the shopping center on um, Tamarack Road there, uh, that's all district property. And so in order to build and, and do those facilities, um, we did uh, we shared in some costs with, uh, with Woodbury in order to do some infrastructure, et cetera, in there. So um, it is worth it. Uh, it was um, passed in 2004 or five, uh, but they put kind of a, a moratorium on it for a number of years because of the recession, so they weren't doing anything. Um, we do have, uh, 
in here. There hasn't been an amount that's been determined yet. I'm working with Heidi Lee and her team. Uh, there will be a um, one-time curriculum initiative, and that's to do curriculum materials for online learning and then help with some of the replacement cycle materials um, that are more expensive than we normally budget on a single year, such as like science and math. So again, this amount will be determined and um, I will bring it to the board for approval um, at the, uh, at the uh, March board meeting. And again, remember last year, we did, a, uh, we did a, about a $600,000 one-time investment or one-time initiative for uh, one-to-one uh, devices. And of course, we did that and then we did a lot because of the, of the CARES and, and, and uh, COVID money. Um, so if you look at the district-wide capital, uh, there isn't a lot of changes here. As you can see, kind of, um, we're going up without including this curriculum initi uh, initiative, uh, online and replacement cycle, I've got a zero there. Uh, so we lo we're looking at about a $46,000 uh, increase. Uh, otherwise, everything stays the same. What ended up happening is operations and maintenance um, usually is budgeted $110,000 per year. They did some, they purchased some trucks about four years ago and that, and that, um, that lease has kind of been paid off. So they're, they're going back now to their full $110,000 per year. But we will, like I said, um, show you what that online and replacement uh, cycle for cur curriculum looks like. And it's probably gonna be um, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, so do be prepared for that. Um, when we look at school sites, Again, this is based upon uh, enrollment, and you can kind of see how it compares from last year to this year. And again, the difference is only about um, $69. And um, so each, each building gets you know, a certain amount of capital. Elementary um, do get less, middle schools get more, and obviously high schools get more here too. So with that, um, for the school sites, you know, we're, we're looking at a, a minor increase here. Um, overall, and I'll, I'll show you here kind of the leases and assessments for the operating um, capital piece of it. Um, the big change here, we do have a little change for intermediate uh, 916. Our debt service for their buildings is um, going to be about $609,000 next year. So it's up just a, just a little bit. But again, last year it went up um, considerably because the new building's coming online. Um, Again, looking at the Woodbury Lake Elmo Economic Development Assessment, we're seeing it go from 352,000 to about 526,000. And uh, in all honesty, that, that is because of the costs of, uh, they're projecting costs to be significantly higher for next year. Now, if they don't spend all that, then of course you know, we get um, a lower assessment last year. But we've got about, um, I think four years left to go on this partnership with Woodbury on, on that development area on Tamarack Road. So it's, it's soon going to be done with here um, very, um, very, very soon. So without um, putting in the um, initiative for curriculum, you can kind of see then that right now we're looking at about um, $5.3 million in our capital budget for next year. And that's an overall increase right now of about 223,000. And that's driven by the Woodbury abatement uh, and then um, operations getting back to their full allotment of capital because their, their loan has been paid off. And then of course, when we add the, um, the curriculum to this piece, um, we could be seeing probably another three to 400,000 here. Um, so this could go up by that amount. And um, like I said, I'm working with Heidi Lee and her team right now to, to come up with what, what that number is going to be. And they're, they're uh, going through the numbers, et cetera, and, and uh, they'll, have that, they'll have that soon for us. Um, if you look at our long-term facilities maintenance projects, now what's happened with all the construction and, and renovation that we're doing to, uh, because of the referendum, um, a lot of our long-term projects have been included in, in those projects, but we are doing a few small projects um, and I'd just like to share those with you. Um, the projects we're currently doing, uh, we're doing roofing repair and replacement uh, and we have been doing that at Skyview and Weaver. Um, the roofing project at Skyview has been separate from the construction project and we started that earlier. Um, we did a lot of this last, last fall 
uh, last summer and fall before um, the construction actually started at, at, um, at Skyview. And of course, Weaver also had um, a roofing, about $700,000 worth of roofing done. Um, again, we did the Weaver classrooms. We put two classrooms uh, in at Weaver um, because of their increased enrollment. Uh, we did uh, site lighting at Tartan Arena to reduce the cost of energy. Um, we did the same thing with our renovation uh, a couple of years ago at Polar. Uh, this has really been an energy savings uh, to go from, uh, you know, standard um, incandescent lighting to LEDs has, has dropped our utility bills considerably. So that project just ended up finishing at Tartan. And so um, Tartan and Polar have been two of our highest energy users, uh, especially for electricity. And so um, we're seeing a significant reduction um, to our bills, which will help our overall uh, utility bill. Um, currently, we're finishing up, or we just finished up uh, a mechanical project at Polar. Um, Polar Arena, remember, was built in 1970. And so we did do some, uh, some new heating and, um, and airflow HVAC systems in there. Again, improving energy consumption and usage. Uh, other improvements that we've done are, are currently finishing is, uh, you know, sidewalks and parking lots where they need, you know, patching, et cetera. Um, we've done a lot of painting around the district uh, in buildings, especially, you know, like Powerin and Weaver, uh, Beaver Lake, Gladstone. And um, we're looking at carpet replacement in Powerin, Weaver, uh, and Beaver Lake. And we did replace um, about a half of those, uh, of those buildings, and we'll do the other half. Um, next year coming up. So looking at next year's LTMF projects, these are separate projects to the actual construction projects that are that are going on. Um, secure entrances and office spaces at Cowan, Weaver, and Gladstone. Those are going to be happening um, during the summer. And this will be a combination of um, bonding monies and then also um, long-term facilities monies as well. So we'll combine those financial sources to, to do these. And these are um, in the planning stages, uh, almost complete with the planning stages. And um, we're looking to go out to bid on these projects here within the next uh, couple months, and they will happen um, during the summer. So um, we're excited and we work with the teams just as we have at North uh, at these three facilities and it's, it's gone well. Wold uh, has done a, a fantastic job. We actually are gonna do some roofing repair and replacement. Power is gonna get a, a new roof Again, remember, they're not um, in the major construction uh, end of it, so they're getting a secure entrance and some, um, some adjustments to their office space. And then they're also due for a new roof, so we will do that this coming summer. Um, and then um, we're working with Wold, and this is um, a really uh, a cool thing that we're doing with them. I partnered with them in my former school district um, to build a, um, a long-term facility in a uh, 10 year database. This is based in Excel. And so we can we can kind of do our long term facilities uh, planning after our buildings are all completed, etc. And keep it on a database so that we know um, what needs to be done from year to year. So I'm, I'm excited um, for that um, to be partnering with them um, for this coming year on that also. And then again, um, as we do every year, uh, trying to fix sidewalks that are cracked and some parking lots that need, you know, patching, et cetera, um, that aren't going to get renovated, uh, painting. And again, um, as I mentioned before, we're going to complete the carpeting um, at Cowork, Weaver, and, and Beaver Lake. Um, when we take a look at our budget and financial uh, projections, we've been working with the cabinet um, and taking a look at uh, kind of where we're at, et cetera. Uh, again, remember, these were our assumptions. You've, you've seen these before. Uh, enrollment is going to be, uh, it's been updated, but what we've decided to do is budget for the same amount of students that we have this year, um, and then um, decrease it by the 80 ADMs um, because we are going to be losing or potentially going to be losing that $750,000 grant for pre-K. So it's when you see the enrollment, it's it's almost the same except for less that 80 um, adjusted daily membership um, or, uh, or pre-K. Uh, we're looking at state aid to be zero, but we're also then uh, looking at compensatory revenue to be held harmless. Uh, so some way that's con that's considerable. This compensatory revenue, of course, is considerable, but um, this is going to be hurtful if if they don't hold us, uh, the state doesn't hold us harmless on that. Most of the metro school districts uh, will have problems. Um, what's causing this is 
because of the universal um, feeding for all um, this past year, uh, we've struggled to get um, folks who qualify for free and reduced to fill out the forms. And so thus, um, everybody in the state's numbers have dropped and so has then compensatory revenue because compensatory revenue is generated by free and reduced um, recipients. So uh, that's that's a big one for us, but um, we're hoping that through legislation, uh, they do something with that because for us, that's $5 million. And for a number of schools around uh, the state, it's significant as well. Um, we just talked about this at my uh, Minnesota Association of School Business Officials. We had a, con a conference uh, a couple weeks ago, and this is this is a big thing that we, you know we talked about, and, and we're hoping that, um, that the legislature does something um, with that, um, for sure. Oops. Um, Pre-K, like I told you, uh, we have grants uh, that was a two-year grant. Um, we will continue to have uh, two buildings. Uh, I think it was uh, Webster and uh, Richardson were the first two grant monies. Um, we'll continue to uh, receive those because they were grandfathered in. Uh, we're looking at special education revenue increasing. That was by state statute, um, based upon our numbers also. Uh, we are receiving CARES and COVID-19 grant monies. Um, and again, these dollars have, be, you know, they are significant uh, and it, they will be used to offset costs where appropriate. Um, our CF, CRF dollars, we received $3.3 .3 million. The first round of COVID-19 uh, uh, grants, the CARES grants, we received 2.2. And we think the second round of grants, we're going to receive about um, $4.9 million. So again, uh, we're going to use those dollars to offset our costs um, where appropriate and where they fit, um, which is, like I said, which is nice. Uh, so again, if we don't see the compensatory revenue show up, if that happens, we do have hopefully some funds that we can circle around with um, to, to make up for that loss of compensatory revenue. Uh, the projection uh, shows roll-up costs um, for all of our, our groups in cost of living increase. Um, utilities, uh, overall 3%. Um, we already have a contract with first student and our vendors, and that is a 2.5% increase for, for next year. Just to let you know, the cost of inflation for next year uh, is projected to be 2.31%. And again, um, we're doing reductions and, and additions to right size enrollment and to then employ our online learning initiative. And I know Christine will probably talk about that um, later on in her superintendent update. Yep, I'll get to that in just a bit here. Yep, and so the fund balance target, of course, remember is between eight and 10. Um, right now, uh, we currently, after this path, this year, we're projected to be about 12.59% at the end of this year. So when we take a look at our enrollment, um, this year versus fund next, you can kind of see with our voluntary pre-K, so when I do the, um, the projections, there's an 80 um, ADM decrease there. But as you can see, when you, when you look at our numbers here, um, we're looking at 10,337 students ending this year. And that's about the same when you take, uh, when you add in the 80, the 80 ADMs for pre-K here. So, so this is uh, at least at this juncture, um, what, what uh, I'm going to use to build our budget on as far as enrollment numbers uh, when we move forward. So our initial projection, and, and you, you remember you've seen that model that I have, it, it has a number of different um, number of different worksheets in Excel spreadsheet. And you know we, we put in numbers for projecting our revenue for five years. We put in numbers to project our expenditures for five years, you know, and our enrollment, of course. And this is the main sheet, you know, that kind of pops out that we look at. Um, again, I'd like to think that this is the worst possible scenario. Um, again, um, that's one of the things I kind of do. I, you know, I, I like to take a look at, you know, uh, maybe what the worst possible scenario is, and then obviously, you know, you know, um, we we hope for the best, etc. So, uh, when I take a look at that uh, right now, it, it looks like uh, you know we're going to use about two million dollars with the fund balance um, uh, this year. Um, I'm hoping you know we break even or, or you know, so because obviously we haven't spent all of our money um, this year, but this is kind of what the model shows. And then for next year, uh, we're looking at using about $6.1 million of, of, of fund balance. Um, so you're looking at, at the end of this year, um, worst possible scenario, 12.59, you know, next year, 8.89, assuming we do use $6.1 million. Um, again, who knows, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, 
all districts are kind of in the same place. Uh, you know, we're we're taking a conservative wait and see approach. I think that's how I would define it. Um, we do have the necessary resources in order to do that. Unlike, let's say, a school district like South Washington, who's uh, you know only got about a two percent fund balance, and and uh, if you've seen in the paper, they're they're cutting ten million dollars for next year. So um, again, I definitely think. Um, you know, the wait and see um, what happens approach is good, assuming, you know, we've done a conservative budgeting approach here. And then we've also, um, we also have the necessary resources uh, to do that. And if we need to then um, do a new path, um, we can do that for the 22, 23, um, you know, school year. So if we need to make some uh, major adjustments um, or, you know, make some adjustments, uh, we can do that going into 22, 23. Again, worst possible scenario, again, 10 million. But again, again, after this, we'll know what the state legislature is giving us. Um, you know, we'll know what our enrollment is going to be. We're hoping, you know, some of our enrollment comes back, um, et cetera. So um, that's kind of where we're at at this point in time. Um, and with that, I guess I will answer any questions that you may have. If I could just make a quick statement. I like to take what Randy says and sum it up in a few words um, because that's a lot of dense information. We've got a couple new board members. So something to be under understand is that our fund balance is basically like our savings account. Um, and it's just like your home, um, your home credit rating. You can have a really big drop in your own credit rating, your ability to borrow money. Uh, if you do not have decent savings, you don't have good credit history, and that happens to school districts as well as it does to homes and people. So our fund balance, um, what Randy's referring to is we spent some time really building it up so that we could be ready for a crisis if one comes. This pandemic is a crisis. Uh, we, if we knew that our enrollment was permanently had dropped as much as it has this year, we'd go, oh, we better cut a significant number of staff so that we can right size ourselves to better match with who we have enrolled in our district. The problem with this year is we don't know who's coming back. We don't know if this is a temporary glitch or if this is gonna be long-term enrollment loss. And this is why this is a year we are going to dip into our fund balance, which we've worked hard to build up and we have it in a very secure place right now. And we're really grateful that we do because who knew a pandemic was gonna hit this year. Next year, if it turns out that our enrollment really does stay at where it is right now, then we will, right size and we will cut our staffing to be uh, proportional to the number of staff that we have students that we have one of the dangers in education of cutting staff um, too quickly without planning ahead is that they're very hard to find again it's very difficult to hire good quality teachers especially in the maths and sciences and special education it's really difficult to hire bus drivers if we lay off bus drivers now and then find out later that we need them it's very hard to get them back so this is one of those years that we've spent a lot of time discussing. This is the time to use a little fund balance so that we can make sure we hang on to good staff that we have. And of course, if our enrollment doesn't come back, we have to right size. So that's in a nutshell, some of what Randy was just talking about. And, and thank goodness for all of our really, really careful. And he says he likes to think of the worst case scenario. That's true. It's called conservative budgeting. And that's a good thing because we always guess, predict the worst and hope for the best, but we base our planning on the worst. And that's what we've done with Randy's leadership in finance. We've done a really good job of that. And, um, and that's why we're in a position right now where we're able to make these decisions. And I will also add that the work that we're currently underway to consolidate some schools and build more efficient operating systems is also right in line with how you have an efficient budget. School districts that maintain really small schools with very small populations of students in them face a lot of overhead costs. And that's part of our master plan with facilities to try to get to a place where we are as efficiently run as possible. And so I just wanna echo that as well. Thanks, Christine. Mm -hmm. All right, any questions or comments from the board? So, so just so everyone knows that, you know, this is kind of a step in the planning process and, you know, we'll have a few more work sessions and meetings and uh, the, the actual budget for 21, 22 isn't approved till the June um, meeting, business meeting. So this just kind of gives you an initial take. Uh, the capital budget though will be approved at the March. Thank you. 
this is really good. All right, thank you, Randy. Uh, any questions, comments, last chance? I guess it's um, enough to make us nervous, but we trust you. <laughs> if I could add, you've also gotten, um, I would hope all board members are receiving uh, Minnesota State High School League emails, or not Minnesota State High School League, uh, Minnesota School Boards Association, MSBA. Um, MSBA has sent out an email, I think just even today saying, please remember to keep advocating at the legislature right now. There is some consideration being had right now for an early action. Typically our legislature, as you know, our legislature funds the state every two years. So they do a two year budget and um, the budget, this is a funding year. So that means there's lots of bills being passed that are, have tails and, and finance attached to them um, at, in the state. But um, there is some consideration now that we just got this new state forecast out this past week that indeed Minnesota has a surplus, which is was not expected back in the fall. Uh, which was really good news because we were really worried about a uh, real deficit uh, in our state funding. So that's been great. But there's some interest growing right now to try to get the legislature to pass some initial funding earlier than they normally do at the end of the legislative session. Like right now in March, get some funding passed for schools for summer programming and other kinds of things where, where folks need the money now. Because as you know, one of the problems we have in school districts is that our fiscal year runs July 1, to June 30th. And when the legislature doesn't wrap up their session until often mid May or often early June, it leaves us kind of hanging, not knowing do we, are we gonna get, how much are we gonna get from the legislature? And that's one of the challenges with school funding in Minnesota, but that's there's a push to try to help uh, bridge that gap because everybody right now is facing some enrollment loss right now, uh, significant enrollment loss. And, and by all means, what Randy mentioned, a loss in, um, free and reduced registration from families because it's been free all year. Why would you register? So if you if you have any questions, do call me and I'll walk you through it because we do want to make sure we're reaching out to our legislature about that. Any of our elected officials. Um, for board members, if you're not getting those emails from MSBA, if you connect with Kim, she can help uh, make sure that you get those. And as always, if you have questions, reach out to me, you know, and find yes, out whatever. Yes, so, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, Randy. Thank you, Christine. Um, next, we have Christine with secondary learning model update. Sure. Um, and Josh, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm logged in on two computers. I apologize, everybody. I'm just trying to if you see me looking one way or the other, I'm going to, I'm going to turn off my mic and video on one and just go from the other. Cause it seems to be doing better. With All right. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Are you good? Okay, great. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you. We've got a couple things. Michelle had asked for an update on where we are with secondary transition planning. So I'm gonna start with that topic first. Um, oops, let me get this so that I'm sharing my screen too. So secondary transition planning. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single item on this slide deck because some of it you just saw last week, um, but I am going to go through, I, I wanted them in the slide deck for reference. Um, partly because this is a, a public document and I wanna always remind people of the considerations that we're making in this area, okay? So I'll buzz through the first sets fairly quickly. Although I do have some updated data on here, right? So um, one thing I always share with you is our current COVID data from the Minnesota Department of Health. And this is that data that talks about, this was that original guidance that came out from the state regarding um, uh, rates um, per 10,000 people per, by county. So taking a look at where we're going as a county, these are the dashboards we always look at. And I have that link at the bottom of the slide for you as well, if you ever wanna go on it yourself. We also have another dashboard that we look at that's actually unofficial, but it's presented, it's put together by a professor at the University of Minnesota. And um, this just gives us, what they do is they put it in real time and where we think we're headed. And superintendents all over our state are checking this dashboard regularly. So you can see Ramsey County's really done a nice job of coming down. There's a little bit of a flattening happening here, um, but, 
but we're hopeful that this is going to continue to trend downward. Washington County um, has also trended downward. And if you recall, these, these rates we're seeing right now are nothing like we were seeing in November and December. We were like at the 100, 150 mark. So that was pretty outrageous. So we're, we're looking a lot better. Um, I talked to you last week about all these different um, precautions that are in place with air purifiers and HVAC upgrades and all these pieces. So I'm not going to get back into all this. I'm just reminding you that we have our, da our dashboard that's here for 622 um, and some guidance documents that we work off constantly from this, the state. We also have a weekly um, call with the Commissioner of Education, a weekly call that happens every Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. And that's where we often get a lot of the updates and guidance as well. Um, this is our current timeline we've been operating under for the last getting kids back into school from the full distance learning where we had. As you know, elementary got back into school over a month ago and secondary is about to transition back to hybrid learning. Um, last week, I spoke with you about the fact that um, the state had come out for with some new guidance um, the week prior stating that it was possible for school districts to start coming back sooner. Um, and one of the challenges we were facing was that we already had all these days in place. Part of the governor's um, order is that it does require we give staff um, planning time, planning days between learning models. So transitioning back from all distance into hybrid model, giving our secondary staff that opportunity for some planning days, which means canceling classes for those days, um, which is tough to do because people have had so much interrupted learning. We didn't wanna, we wouldn't, didn't wanna um, have to keep doing that, but we know that we, we owe that to our staff as well. We also know that we had spring break. A couple of our dates, February 26th and March 5th, were both days that were already on the on the calendar for us um, with no school in place per our contract, normal contract. Um, so as you know, next week is our spring break week for District 622. We're one of the early spring break groups. You may recall a year ago, uh, we were the early spring break group um, ourselves in East, some of the East Metro districts. And it was really tricky because this is right when COVID was popping at the at last year at this time. And I was just thinking back to how that felt a year ago and where we were at and we were having staff come back from travel and things like that. So um, this is where we're at. So of course we're looking at when and how are we going to continue to increase our learning models. Before I do that, I want to just, I know there was a question about some instructional model and aggregate student enrollment data. And I'm going to give you some more other stuff as well. Some of the pieces that we are looking at. These are the percentage of students who are choosing in-person learning right now. And these are the percent that are choosing online with the data that we have right now. As you know, our elementary data is based on kids already back in school. Middle and high school data is based on what parents have told us their plans are. I've also got some data um, at the request of our board wanted to look at what does this look like by demographics. So um, I do have some of this information here as well. So elementary schools, it gives you, and, and I'll let board members take a look at this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna scroll to our secondary just because that's what we're kind of talking about right now. Um, hopefully I can get to a place where you can see all secondary at one time on the screen. Let me zoom in a little bit. I gotta move my pictures of all of us over so I can get to it. Okay, so there's been this conversation about students that are choosing distance learning or to remain in distance learning. So hopefully I can scroll in a way that makes it readable to you. I'm trying to get it to show just the secondaries. Hang on a second. So Skyview, okay, here we go. John Glenn Middle. Christine. Yes. I look uh, through the board books and I, there was, this information was not there. Is there a way you can send it to us so that we can have it? You will have all of this information. This was just, this number's changing every day right now. So I didn't put it in there last week because I wanted to give you the most latest and greatest. You will have all this for sure. Okay. Absolutely. So taking a look at, for example, John Glenn. John Glenn has 43% um, of their students are staying in distance learning. Of those students, 85% are students of color. Maplewood Middle has 42% of their students staying in distance learning. Of those, 80% are students of color. Skyview is 40% in distance learning and 70% are students of color. North High, 54% students staying in distance of those 75% are students of color. And then Tartan High School is 54% students staying in distance learning and 68% of those are students of color. And yes, this is all, all of this is public record once I present here to you all. So you all have it and, and the public will have this as well. I wanted you to have the most current. That's why I put today's date on here because I wanted you to have the most current numbers. 
But as you can see, the vast majority of our students are re that are remaining in in discipline. So you, you do have demographic breakdowns, though, because it, I could, just, it could be that that uh, there could be thirty percent white parents that there are. I mean, yeah. You do have demographic breakdowns. That's what we have. Tartan High School, distance learning. 54% of those that are staying in distance learning, 68% are students of color. So with that, I got to do my math. 22% are, or 32% are students who are white parents, right? So yes, that's exactly what this is showing you. No, no, no. What I'm saying, 68%. It is are the people that said that they want to stay in whatever learning? No, nope. that would be fifty four percent. Yeah, so, but that that does not equate to the students of color, though. Of the fifty four, you're saying is that sixty eight percent of are of this cohort of students, 54% of our students at Tartan that are staying in distance, 68% are students of color. If you want me to add the column for how many of those are white, it would just be the opposite that adds up to 100, but I can certainly add that if you need it. It would be nice to know the demographics. Okay, this does give you demographics. So if there's a different way you wanna look at it, we can talk about that later, but this tells you, okay of the students, how many students of color and what percent of students of color are staying in hybrid and what percent of students of color. So yes, I can present it to you in a different format if that makes it easier for you later. And if, if you can email to me, that'll be great too. I mean- I think we should probably talk it through so I make sure you, you're getting it the way you want it because this is the demographic data, but if you need it in a different format, then I'll, I'll talk to you about it afterwards, Charlotte. We can figure out what, you, what you're looking for. Okay. Yep. So um, I talked to you last time about, um, what's been happening and, and I did add in, I told you this verbally last time, but I put it in there, uh, interventions for struggling learners, that 497 of those had been coming in during person and distance learning, even when we were in distance learning, had been coming in for some in-person services during that time. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the vaccine rollout because it really does impact our decision and our planning. Um, I told you last time that there's three different ways our staff can be vaccinated through the state program, county program, uh, which would be Ramsey or Washington County, and then also through private clinics. Um, and what, what the only problem is we don't have a way of knowing. State does not tell us how many of our staff have been vaccinated or who's been vaccinated. That's personal data of the staff. So they can only tell us if they choose to. We've been trying to do surveys of our staff to figure out right now, we've gotten word from our own internal survey that 964 of our 1700 staff have gotten vaccine either their first dose or have their appointment for their first dose. We believe that number is actually quite a bit higher. The last few days have been really increasing, like dramatically increasing, which is fantastic for us. So we're seeing really great progress very recently. I will say this, our district was um, slower to access, va accent, uh, access vaccines than others were. There were some, I think part of it might've been because we straddled two different uh, counties and so, there was a little bit of a disconnect happening there, but we happened, we were able to fix that and we're really getting some good, good vaccine appointments now and they're coming fast and furious. I've had people tell me now they're getting two appointments from different vendors at the same time. So um, they're, we're trying to figure out who's been vaccinated and who hasn't, but we're very much looking pretty good. We, we believe that most staff will have that first dose for sure before the end of March. Um, we hope all staff will have at least their first dose before the end of March. So I wanna talk a little bit about next steps. You already know that this week, um, we don't have school March 3rd and 4th. Now this references back to the previous timeline. We, and March 5th, this was already at elementary conference and grading day. And then of course we have our spring break. Our secondary students returning to hybrid on March 15th. Um, I put a couple of dates that are important in here because I wanna kind of put these by you. This week, a lot is happening. We have a board work session. Tomorrow night, we have a COVID response team. Our hope is that actually we'd like to get a date out there to start talking about with a February, uh, April return. I think given the, the progress that, oh, sorry, I apologize. The progress that we have had right now with regard to um, 
vaccine in the last just week alone has really helped us a lot, I think, with our progress. So we've got um, staff coming in the buildings for professional development later this week. And so it's a good time for us to do a feedback loop with our staff. But we are uh, we had a big meeting with our, our secondary principals and others, and we are looking tentatively at an April increasing our return. Not It wouldn't be a full return because we still have a bunch of students who are in distance learning at home, but it would be up to four days a week, which is what most districts are doing when they come back. We're hoping to look at a date of possibly April 5th. Um, and that's kind of what we're floating out there. I didn't want to um, put that full in writing tonight because we are going to do some feedback loop with our staff in the next day or two. We have a regional support team meeting this Friday. And I think that'll be another place where we'll get some guidance. The last time we met with our regional support team a couple weeks ago, they were very clear with us. They did not see us in a place to be ready to go to full in person or bringing back all students who wish to come back in person at the same time. Um, I do believe that with the rates dropping as they have and with our vaccine rates going up as they have now finally been doing, I think they will probably get behind and support that. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, Ideally, we hope to have a communication out to families this week, but we're going to go through these couple of, of layers of conversations first. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Um, increasing our in-person time for students to come in from, from two days a week to four days a week. Part of the reason, and this is why almost every district anywhere in the metro is sticking with a four-day week, because they still the teachers still need a day to be able to teach the students who are learning at home and to push out lessons for those students who are learning at home. And so that's where that um, that element is coming into play with that. As soon as we no longer require to re uh, do distance learning, then that could go away and we could go back to full five days a week. The reason we could do five days a week at elementary and not secondary is because at elementary, we were able to separate out, let me see, I like to see faces when I talk. We were able to separate out, these are the teachers that are gonna do distance learning online kids. And these are the ones that are gonna teach in-person kids because all the teachers share a similar license area. In secondary, there's so many different licenses. Those teachers have to teach both groups. There's no way to separate them out. And so that's why at secondary, it's more tricky to go back full time. But that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, and that's sort of our, our thinking around those areas. So with that, I am open to comments and discussion around that topic. Charlotte, go ahead. Um, so I remember uh, the governor uh, talked a few weeks ago about, you know, the goal for opening all the schools. I think he gave a date. I, I remember it was early March, I think. Uh, but uh, this the second part of this question, it sounds like you're uh, uh, maybe listening to the staff. Uh, there are in our school district, which is which is good, but um, I'm also wondering how are we pairing as far as um, our neighboring um, uh, district? How are we doing? I, I, you know, are we? As you know, you and I both know that uh, uh, parents are always comparing themselves to Maramira, Saint Paul, Woodbury. Uh, and, and so forth and so forth. So how are we doing as far as um, our secondary uh, school um, uh, transition? Uh, how is it going as far as compared to other uh, school districts that are around us? So great question. First of all, I'd like to just mention that the governor's uh, request was that schools get back into either hybrid or full-time in March which is what we're doing. So back out of full distance learning. So we are in totally following that recommendation because, and we already had those plans before the governor came out with that order. So that's not anything different. Um, with regard to our neighboring districts, just recently, uh, people have been starting to talk about full return or almost full return in person. Most have been in hybrid mode until now. Um, now that vaccines have picked up, we are making progress. So we're, we're very comparable to neighboring districts. Um, school districts like St. Paul schools are gonna go back, I think the middle of April 15th or something, they're gonna go back full time or close to full time in their, their uh, learning model. The other thing that I, I will say, um, we are very much different than Matamira and Southwash and Stillwater by the number of our students who are choosing to stay at home in distance learning. So it's, it's harder for us to be compared in the same regard 
because we don't have the same number of students who are choosing to go back to school. We have many, the governor says we still have to provide distance learning to kids at home. And that is why we have to think differently about how our teacher's day is spent. If our teachers don't have time in their schedule to be able to teach the kids at home. So this is not about listening to teachers, whether they wanna to go to work or not. It's about how do we schedule their time? Because one of the things we have done really, I think well is in our online program, our kids don't just work independently. It's not an independent study. They get Zoom time with their teachers and they're actually in groups and in discussions. And so if our teachers have to go to full-time working with students in school, and mind you, less than half of our high school students are coming back for that in-person learning and more than half are gonna stay home. We need to teach the kids at home. We can't just throw a book at them and say, you're good for the next few months, right? And that's part of why I wanted you to see that our students at home are a much greater majority students of color than the students who are coming back in person. So that's why I wanna be clear the things that we have to weigh in balance when we consider how we manage our schedule and how we bring students and our, bring our staff back. So, so based on what you just said, I think that as a, uh, maybe as, as a uh, board, we need to talk about what we should be doing because we, we all know uh, based on uh, uh, studies that uh, this pandemic and the online learning and everything has exacerbated uh, uh, the academic achievement gap between the white students and the students of color. So based on what you're saying is that there's no problem, right? Is what, that what you're saying? Oh my goodness, absolutely not. I'm not saying there's no problem. I'm not even talking about achievement. I'm talking about the schedule right here. The, no, no, the no. I'm, is what, what I'm, I'm talking about in the context of um, the online learning and that it does not work for all the students of color. And I think what you have been telling us is that yes, it's working and that's what the, student, the parents, uh, you know, that's what they want. I think that's what you're saying, right? No, I'm not saying the program is perfect by any means. Okay. I'm telling you the governor's requiring us to continue to offer it. And so we have to offer it. The concern is when we offer it, are we gonna reduce all the contact that teachers currently have with those students at home? Or are we gonna create time in that teacher's day to connect with those kids at home? Because there are so many that are staying home. And a lot of it has to do with various reasons. There's a disproportionate impact on COVID on families and communities of color. We have a lot of families that are saying, I'm not sending my child back until they get vaccinated and children are not vaccinated yet. Our data is not hugely different than many other districts that are high diversity. What I'm saying, Charlotte, is that if what you as a board wanna tell me is I have to bring all my teachers back full time and forget about the kids at home, I won't do that. I can't forget about the kids at home because it's more than 50% of our kids are staying home. So I can't forget about the kids at home. I have to keep trying to find a way to offer them good programming. If the governor were to take away that requirement and say, everybody has to come back and you don't have to provide online school anymore, that would make things easy. The problem is the governor's program says we have to continue to provide online programming through this school year because of the pandemic. And I'm not going to ignore 50% of our kids at home and just give them independent study lessons. I want them to have access to a teacher. And that's the thing I'm fighting for here. I'm telling you that, no, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I am saying that if, if, if we decide we're gonna say our teachers spend five days a week, all day in class with students in person, and 55% of the kids are still staying home. By, and of those, that group at home, let's say we've got 2,000 kids staying home. And the all, vast majority of those are kids of color. I'm not going to let my teachers ignore them. They, they have to have time to serve them. And that's what I'm speaking to. And yeah. I'm not saying we should ignore them either. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that as a board, we need to come up with strategies to serve those students so that they can succeed and not be left behind. That's, that's really all I'm saying. 
So I hear you asking for a report from my principals of how they've been helping make sure nobody's failing. I'd be happy to bring that report forward. Yes. And that's been, I would say, everything we put every meeting and every energy into is exactly that question. But that's why I want to be really clear when I say that what we're talking about isn't about teachers wanting to work or not want to work. Our teachers are working really hard to make sure no child fails. And if they can't be in two places at once, how do we make sure we have a schedule that really serves our kids well? And so it's not about listening to teachers. It's about problem solving with teachers. How do we make sure no one fails? And how do we build a schedule that can help us do that? So that's what every superintendent around us is talking about. And that's what we're talking about. What makes things different in 622 is we have more families choosing to stay in person. I mean, I, I, at home until they get vaccinated. We have more families choosing that option. I think the really tough thing too that we're looking at is um, just take taking hybrid uh, <clears throat> in a couple of weeks when we start that is um, I, I believe the governor has said that teachers don't need to do both distance and hybrid. And from what I've been hearing, um, my teachers or my son's teachers tell him is that, and my son's gonna be a distance learner um, for try three. Um, while the teachers are teaching hybrid and in person, with the kids that choose to come to class, um, a lot of the teachers are going to be streaming their class live, and and the and the distance students are expected to show up and get their lessons at the same time the hybrid students are physically face to face with the teacher. Um, the teachers I don't think are supposed to do that, but they're going to do that because that's the best that we can oh. do. They're going to bat for us. Um, they're going to bat for the kids because they don't want those the, the families that choose to stay at home or the students that choose to stay home for health reasons, um, for any multitude of reasons, just depending on what kind of a family um, you are, uh, the dynamics that everyone is seeing. Um, our teachers know that and the, the best that they can offer is to make sure that while they're teaching the hybrid students and the students that are in the class, they also pipe, they, they open up the Zoom so that their students at home can hear that lesson too. And they don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's to your point. It's, uh, I love what you just said, Ben, because I, I want to clarify, it's not about they're not supposed to do it. The governor's rule says we can't require them to do both. We are so fortunate in 62 because our teachers almost every one of them is willing to do both. And they are doing both. Um, that's not the case for every district. I can promise you, I've had that conversation with so many superintendents. Um, so our staff have really stepped up and are going above and beyond to do both at the same time. It's just that if you are managing a group of 11 year olds in a classroom and you're putting them in discussion groups to also be putting the kids online into discussion groups and then trying to make sure there's something meaningful coming of it rather than just having the kids online follow along at their own pace. So these are things we've all been working through. Um, and I think that what might be helpful, um, I think that last fall we had a lot of discussion about this when we were talking about hybrid model versus in-person and all that. I'm wondering if, especially for our couple of new board members, it might be helpful to visit some classrooms. I know Michelle and I walked through classrooms together, Charlotte and Julia. Michelle and I walked through many classrooms last fall and it kind of helped explain what the issue is about how teachers teach simultaneously and what their schedule looks like. But um, no, we've been very much on par with our neighbors in this regard. And that's one of the things that we're, you know, trying to figure out the best way to do. And, um, and now that we're finally getting vaccinated in the way that we are, we're very much looking forward to moving to the next step. I think a challenge too would be, you know, I, Christine, did you say that we're looking at maybe a four or five or April 5th? To move to full time four days a week. That's yeah, we like looked at. That's the thought. Yeah, well, we've got a regional support team meeting this week, um, okay. and we want to hear what they have to say to us. But one of the issues is that a lot of our staff aren't going to get their second dose of the vaccine until the very last week of March. If for the the vast majority who've just gotten it, they're going to get their second dose the last week of March, and that's that kind of window of time where they're going to be better protected. Um, 
so that's kind of the that's the angle we were looking at with regard to that date. So the 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 thing that um, maybe uh, strikes me as as probably maybe even a tougher situation than the hybrid is um, if we do return, you know, in April um, to full uh, full time with four days a week. Um, will there be still, a, 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 it, we potentially could still have a situation where um, the governor still allows for um, distance learning to be a-, a Oh, for sure. A, I would oh, expect that through this year. Yeah. So um, I would think like if we're full, if we're fully back and everyone's going four days a week, if you choose to go um, to school um, in person, um, that means the teacher, the teachers will have- bigger classes, um, which means they'll even have less time with their distance students. Um, I can see the hybrid being a lot more feasible because with, with both distance and hybrid, um, because you have, you have smaller class sizes, right? Mm -hmm. um, with hybrid. Mm -hmm. So when you're live with maybe, I'm not sure, I'm just gonna ballpark it. Let's just say you're, if you're live in person with 10 kids, mm -hmm. um, and then you have your other 20 kids on the computer, you can still probably get some time to talk to your students on the Zoom call. But suddenly when you ramp it up and you have 20 kids in class in front of you and 10 kids on Zoom, um, you probably have less of a chance to connect with your kids at, dis at, at a distance. And so kind of to Charlotte's point, like um, that'll probably be the next conversation, but I'm sure you guys are already talking about it, but what are some of the ways that um, we can continue to support the kids at home um, mm -hmm. through the rest of the, through those last couple months of school. Um, oh, sure. And so it doesn't turn into like um, last, last spring when it was a lot of, um, you know, it was it, last spring was tough, right? It was really tough because we weren't even one to one as a district with devices. It was really tough. I'll say um, a couple thoughts in conversations with our secondary principals about this. Um, we are very much so. If we're going back uh, the fifteenth of March. Our teachers by April fifth will have had three weeks back in the hybrid model, and um, I we and talking to the principals, the hope is that a lot of the anxiety of how to do both will have dissipated a little bit because there will be practice doing so um, and that that will give them an opportunity to kind of try and test some things. Now we also as you know and this is in the the MSBA bill that we're trying to fight for too are really ramping up summer programming. We're even in place talking about Saturday school and how to bring in more supports for the weekend supports as well like we've had in the past um, but I think that um, but absolutely and every single principal has their list hot list of who they're working with, who they're concerned about. Our counselors and our teach, lead teachers are working to monitor every single student's attendance, every single course failure, or students who aren't turning in homework. And so there's a lot of effort to kind of keep track of all of these things. Um, one of the issues that's come up, by the way, and I know that some of you may have heard about this concern, that the governor's the State Department has also, there's a lot of things that have been put in place that make it kind of, they're, they're, they're difficult, right? So the State Department says you have to offer in-person learning and you have to offer at-home learning, but they don't double your staff to be able to do that, right? But then they tell you, you can't make a teacher do both at the same time, the same hour of the day. So you have to figure out their schedule to do it, right? So first of all, we have to do both, but then you can't make a teacher simultaneously do both at the same time. Like that's also in the order. And then in the order, it also says any teacher who does both of those things has to be given uh, additional prep time in their day, which we agree with because this is not easy, especially for teachers who haven't done this in, in their whole lives. So we've had to shorten the day a little bit to legally provide the extra time for preparation planning that's in the governor's order as well. Um, and so there's these, these many different kind of pieces at play. Um, there's also language in the MDE guidance, which by the way is hundreds of pages of information that says um, that we need to be really mindful of the GPA impacts on students. So where a student may otherwise be failing a class, we need to be offering pass fail so that we can create opportunities, which we fully agree with. But we have parents telling us, don't let my child pass a class if they didn't do the work. And yet 
we're under these guidance from the state to tell us to do that. So it, it, there's so many things that like, I understand the, I understand all these things, but so we are trying to constantly talk to our neighbors. We problem solve. We talk to our neighboring districts, literally I do every single day, sometimes twice a day because we're problem solving all of these together um, because they're not unique to us. It's just that there's a lot of different, um, a lot of different guidance pieces that are in place in Minnesota. And, and sometimes they kind of make, all of this difficult, right? So that's what we're always problem solving together. And so I feel really good about the rigor we've offered. Uh, it's by all means not perfect. And I, if there were anything we could do is take what we've learned from this year and the good stuff and lose the bad stuff and make next year the best year we've ever learned because our teachers now have a whole different set of skills they didn't have before. But summer school programming, we are ramping it up in ways we've never done before. We need to maximize every minute of our summer um, to accelerate. And I wanna really be clear, we talk a lot in our district about not remediate, but accelerate learning. Um, our students are brilliant young people and they have opportunities to grow and when opportunities are given to them. And so we are continuing to figure out ways to do that, um, not just during right now, but also during the school year as well, so. Uh, Christine, could I ask a question? Sure, oh, of course. Okay. okay. Um, you know, relative to staffing, mm -hmm. um, I know it's it's kind of a nightmare, but I mean, David Law, you know, the soup of Anoka and Hennepin, you know him very well. I mean, he testified that uh, he needs these, um, what do you call short call substitutes, or he wouldn't have bodies in classrooms, you know, because they're back full in person. And so, are you in favor of that short call substitute thing? In other words, they're trying to, what? Uh, I know what he's trying to do. I, you know, make a waiver so that, so, you know, people don't have to be a fully licensed teacher. You know? I, can, I can explain that. Sure. Yeah. Nancy, th great point. And it is a great point. Um, and I do talk to David all the time. Talk to him today. I'm in meetings with him a lot. Yeah. Um, and so... Yes, it, and he did testify to this issue that's really, uh, really brilliant, actually. So um, one of the issues he's speaking about right now, there's a couple reasons why we're short of substitutes. First of all, we had all districts in the state, we had a substitute shortage, substitute teacher shortage before the pandemic. That's nothing new. We all had a substitute teacher shortage before the pandemic. But then now some of the issues we're dealing with, like right now today, and this is why he would have test he testified, and I talked to him about this, why he testified that this should be in the right now bill, not the later bill, because um, there's certain requirements. So if you want to become a short call substitute, we all hire short call substitutes. That means a substitute who's in a classroom for 15 days or less. If a teacher, if somebody's going to be a substitute in a classroom more than 15 days, they need to be licensed in the content area that they are substituting for. So if it's a math teacher, if it's a science teacher, if it's, you know, chemistry teacher, math teacher, whatever, they have to be licensed in the area. Short call subs, which are for a day or two, up to up to three weeks, can serve in that role without being licensed in the content area. And for most substitutes, it's a one day job, right? Here's a couple things that are affecting us right now. We have teachers who are finally getting the vaccine, which is wonderful, but we are seeing people, and I don't even wanna say this because I don't wanna deter people from getting vaccinated, who really are saying they don't feel good the next two days afterwards, right? And, and we've even heard Anthony Fauci say the same thing, right? So there's some residual fallout to um, uh, having Anthony Fauci, like, like this whole thing about having the, the vaccine, it, you, there are some ill effects afterwards. And all across the Metro, we had a conversation about this last week that there are teachers who don't feel good and then they call in sick the next day. And so we want our staff to get vaccinated, but then we're also dealing with a substitute shortage as they are getting vaccinated usually for a day or two. What that bill that he testified to is referring to is in the state of Minnesota, we have a tiered licensure program in general for teaching, right? So there's there's a tier four license means you went to college, you have a degree in that area and you're licensed to teach it. But there's varying degrees of licensure that fall under that. And in Minnesota, several years back, there were, there were the tiered licensure program was adopted. And that allowed for people who maybe have some alternative pathways into education to get temporary licensures 
understanding that they have to get that degree within a certain amount of time, but that that would allow them to teach earlier. It was really created so that people come in from different states, staff of color, people who are coming from different um, backgrounds uh, would be able to get their foot in the door with teaching without having to go through such a long process as long as they agreed to get through the process. All that bill is suggesting is that we allow the same for substitute teachers. Right now, a substitute teacher has to have a four-year college degree. This bill would allow for two years of college, uh, an associate degree or equivalent somehow. And it would allow, again, this is short call, like you're going to come into school for a day or two or three, and you're going to substitute in a classroom. It would open the door for so many more substitute people to be eligible to be substitute teachers who aren't currently so. And of course, they'd have to do their background check and there'd be training involved and there's all kinds of things to make sure that they can handle it. But obviously, the, the classroom teacher at, in a short call situation, the classroom teacher is planning the lessons, right? So they're not creating content. They're basically there to implement and, and um, instruct during that teacher's absence. And this, this would allow us to be able to um, do that with people who have varying degrees of college experience, not maybe if they haven't graduated all the way. And I, I would think about like those of you in higher ed, Michelle and Charlotte, you both work in higher ed. I'm sure you can think of some people who are not quite graduated, but would be really great to be able to pick up a sub job for a day or two or three. Cause you, you know, there are people who are really um, probably would be great with kids and would be able to do that. I mean, in a short call situation, of course. And that's kind of the thing we're trying to look at is expanding the options to hire some other people into those roles. We have paraprofessionals, for example, who are great with our kids, but they can't be a short call sub for us um, unless they have four years of college. But we have paraprofessionals who have two years of college or three years of college or three and a half years of college who already know the students in the class, but they can't be a short call sub for us because they haven't finished the four-year degree. And this is about opening those doors so that we could get better, uh, op more options in, in place for that. So that's what that's about. Yeah, no, I understand. And, and it's controversial because, you know, what you, I mean, you made a good case for, for doing that, um, you know, the, the other side um, of the, another way to look at that is teachers who have, um, who have, you know, accumulated debt and years and blah, 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 to get their four year degree. And now, you know, it's a slippery slope, they think, because we're letting in, you see what I'm saying? People that are not qualified, not trained, and mm -hmm. they're in front of a class. So, you know, I mean, that's, oh, for sure. that's the other argument. That's the other argument. But um, uh, yeah, the one thing I don't want to see happen, I'm sure you don't, I'm sure no one does, is somebody walking into a classroom who's not trained and not ready to handle a classroom, right? I mean, this is what we don't want to happen. But we, we certainly want, you know, we don't want to send everybody home because there's nobody there for you know to to teach mm -hmm. on the other hand we we certainly want you know qualified trained mm -hmm. people in front of our kids right. so um if I know, it's a conundrum and i i'm just you know you know i'm just uh, pointing that out so um, and, and it sounds like you're in favor of that particular um legislation well, let me just explain one more thing, Nancy. So right now, and again, this is for short term calls and I'll come to you next, Charlotte, for short call subs. So those who are just there for uh, a day or two or three or four, or like those short term subs, right now, they don't have to have any background in education whatsoever, mm -hmm. none. And so they just have to have a four-year degree. That four-year degree may not necessarily prepare them to be a teacher in any way, shape or form, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they have a four-year degree. This would, and, and again, this is not in any way talking about teachers for to actually be the licensed teacher. This is just a short term, like a short call sub. There's long term subs. And when we talk long term subs, it's a whole different story, right? So, yeah. right now, short term subs, many of whom, yes, they have a degree in something, but they have never, ever even been in front of children whatsoever, like have no business whatsoever. They, they literally haven't. And so, to be a short call sub, you don't, all you need is a four-year degree. This would just say for short-term call subs, like, and, and I don't know, there's different ways you could slice and dice this, this guidance. Like we could find some rules around it. Like you have to have experience with children or you have to have um, some different abilities to, you know, we, we always in our district have the ability to say, 
okay, that substitute teacher didn't work out. We're not bringing them back tomorrow or ever and put them on the do not call list. We can do that anytime we need to, but they all have to have a criminal background check and they all have to fit the criteria to get the short call license from the state. This would just say, and, and this is where I wanna just, I just wanted to be clear, short call substitutes are not licensed teachers, mm -hmm. typically. In fact, most of the time they're not. They just have to have a four-year degree in something and it could be anything. Mm -hmm. So this just expands it to some additional people who maybe would like to get into it but haven't quite finished their four-year degree yet. And how so, much do you, how much do you pay them? We pay our substitutes about $165 a day. Okay, that's, and I'll a tell you better, one thing. that's a little better than Anoka pays them. Well, actually, I was just going to tell you, Anoka, David Law just told me a couple days ago that they just decided on Fridays they're paying their subs double. Yeah. So they're yeah. going to get $300 a day on a Friday because oh, that's when we're yeah. short subs anytime in the spring. Okay. And I thought that was super interesting. I was like, well, that's interesting, right? So yeah. Um, yeah. It's a real problem in schools when we're short subs, and this is not something just during a pandemic. It's a it's a problem all the time, and right. particularly Fridays in the spring. Yeah, I mean, you know, in a perfect world, <laughs> right? We wouldn't need, you know, we wouldn't need to be addressing this. You know, with I, the agree. Short, that, I agree. Because that, you know, I I don't like the idea of of you know diminishing the teaching profession in any way. You know what I'm saying? Um, I agree, but but let me just tell you real quick, and, and I wanna to jump to Charlotte's question. What, what happens when we don't have a substitute? So in elementary schools, typically what happens if we don't have a substitute? Let's say we have a third grade teacher without a, a substitute that day. The other third grade teachers divide up that class and take half the class into their rooms for the day. So if I'm a third grade teacher, instead of having 26 kids in a class, you know, I could have 42 or something for the day. Um, and the way it works is we pay each of those teachers half that sub day pay. So they get what, $75 for it. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, that's kind of where it lands. In high school, that doesn't happen. So what happens in high school is, let's say an English teacher is out missing for the day and, and, and is absent that day. Mm -hmm. They teach six hours of the day. We, the principal will look at first hour and see who has their personal prep time that hour. And they have a rotation of who comes in and covers that class. Mm. And they get paid for a little bit like 20 bucks or something for or 30 bucks for a missed prep period. So what happens is those teachers then, instead of having their own preparation time, are now covering for the teacher who's not there without a substitute. And it's a real issue in schools and it's a real issue everywhere across the state. And, and so the idea that we could have the opportunity to bring in some additional people is a favorable idea. So okay. that's just my opinion. Okay, it's, it's good to know. And I, and I know that you know, these staffing issues are, you know, hugely more complicated in the secondary, you know, at high school level than at the elementary level. And this is why, you know, we haven't, you know, we're talking about April 5th instead of, you know, whatever, you know, much earlier. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but anyway, okay, thank you. But even in an elementary school, just to add, like, if you're a teacher who does small groups to intervene with every child and their individual needs, when you suddenly have 42 kids in the room, you can't do that as well. So it's very real at the elementary as to what they can do in terms of moving achievement and supporting kids in their learning. Needs. So I just wanted to throw that out there. All right, Charlotte, I wanted to get to you. I know you've been waiting a long time. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I was one of those uh, professional uh, short call sub for about a couple of years and I, it helped fund, it, it helped fund uh, to fund my, uh, master's uh, at graduate school and um, I had a great experience and, um, and now I actually uh, teach in higher education. I teach teachers and, um, and I, I just want to say in higher education, nobody needs any credentials to be able to teach any um, in higher education. Uh, anyone and anyone with with a PhD or whatever can go teach in higher education. But I just wanted to say uh, uh, that um, before I, I was uh, one of those um, uh, short call sub license, short call sub, I did take a training. It was about two weeks. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the licensing board does 
require uh, training and um, and I'm, I'll, I'll be the first one to say that it's not adequate training, but they, to, they do teach you on how to work with children and all that. So, you know, if you get in a new environment, how to do uh, classroom uh, management and, and following um, uh, teachers' uh, lesson plans that they, they leave behind, if, if they do, because I, I, I in many classrooms where there were no lessons plans and I walked in and it's like, you know, and then, you know, and I, I had to, mm -hmm. but um, I'm, so since you guys are talking about uh, those substitute teachers, just want to say I did it for a couple of years and, and um, yeah, that, you know, I, I love doing it at a time, but it's not something that I would have spent the rest of my career doing. Mm -hmm. Because Thank you for that. Charlotte, can I ask you a question? And I and I agree. I did substitute teaching out of college myself. And I think about myself fresh out of college versus some of our paraprofessionals, how good they are. They already know our students and the idea of them being able to be our substitutes when they can would be just wonderful. And, and then on the days they substitute, they get paid as substitute teachers too. But Charlotte, do you have any students, if you're thinking about this as a, as a professor in higher ed, do you have, can you think of any students you know that haven't finished their four-year degree but would probably make pretty good substitute teachers right now? Yeah, most of our students will if they had um, opportunity, especially since they get to put that on a resume as mm -hmm. a teaching experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They'll probably do it. I thought so. Yeah. My observation would be that I'm glad you don't intend to apply that same criteria to uh, doctors and other professionals that anyone who happens to be enrolled in a, in a post-secondary class could end up being, you know, your doctor tomorrow if your regular doctor called in sick. You know, I'd like to be able to know that if I was in surgery that my surgeon was actually trained and skilled at being a surgeon and not just you know, somebody who happened to be uh, in the bottom third of their class in a medical program at some college somewhere. Um, but I also don't think that this is, a, this is a, something that will solve our short-term need um, for the long-term problem. I think this is an end run around and, and possibly the soft sell introduction of, of demeaning our teaching profession. If it takes a couple of weeks, somebody has to apply, they want to be a substitute teacher, they got to go through a couple of weeks of training, and then they've got to, to have the time be available, either be through a substitute employer program where a school district contracts with someone who supplies substitute teachers, or be interviewed and have background checks and everything by the school district they're going to substitute teach in. That's not something that's gonna solve our need for substitute teachers because of COVID during the next four weeks. That's, that's really guising a short-term answer to a long-term problem. Um, and I think there's a reason, although a lot of people don't agree with it and I find it kind of frustrating myself sometimes, but there are good reasons why we have those teaching licenses oh, yeah. at those different times in, in, in the student's educational experience. And to say that that doesn't matter if somebody happens to get sick now all of a sudden tomorrow, you know, I, when my kids would have substitute teachers in school, it would be, hey, we're going to watch a movie. Hey, we're going to, even in our PLCs, we, um, we struggled a lot to have lesson plans prepared ahead for planned absences where substitutes were going to come in. So there's, I mean, I just don't think that this is a good answer to what I think is a very real problem. That's fair. And just so you um, know, we already have tiered licensure in our regular teaching ranks already. So people who are in a program already can get a license. Very short term, it's not long term, it's very short term. Like they have to finish the teaching program to continue it, but th that already exists. And so, yeah, I hear what you're saying though. Um, I'm going to try to do a better job of allowing all board members to weigh in. So, Julia, do you want to add anything? Yeah, 
If not, that's fine. Yeah, you're okay. Okay, I do want to go back to the learning model conversation, though, um, because there are questions that community members are asking me, and I think you know we might all benefit from a better understanding of our district's position. So I think that families throughout, you know, in our district as well as throughout the country, really, they want their kids to attend in-person school. Um, hybrid is not is not as good an, as good of an option, right? Um, all the guidance from the CDC, Minnesota Department of Health, says open your school if you can, right? Mm -hmm. There were articles this weekend in both the Star Tribune and the New York Times that highlighted that our students of color are being disproportionately denied access to full in-person learning. Those districts where they have high numbers of students of color have made the decision again and again not to allow them to come back to school. So our neighbors, they are opening to full in-person four or five days a week. And that includes St. Paul, Minneapolis, Stillwater, Montemedi, White Bear Lake, South Washington, Moundsview, Bloomington, Anoka, Hennepin, I don't know who else, but everyone I looked at, their plan is to come back to school full in person, whether that be four days or five days. Now that wasn't, I, I didn't realize that, you know, we are uniquely going to hybrid. And I do feel that that's problematic. I guess I feel like I need to understand like what exactly are the barriers that others don't have and are we certain that we can't use whatever solution those other districts are using to overcome those barriers? Um, you know, continuing to deny full in-person learning for our learners due to barriers that others are overcoming, you know, it doesn't make me feel good. And the CDC specifically states in the guidance and MDH specifically states that schools should not be using access to vaccination as a condition to reopen schools. So I'm just not clear what we think will change between now and April that will allow us to open in April. You know, if whatever those barriers are, why aren't they the same in every district? And how, is, how are they gonna disappear between now and April? Well, I'll say this. I know for one, St. Paul Public Schools is coming back full in person on April 14th. So I will argue it's not the same for every district, right? Some of it has to do with when we have when we have our returns to in-person and what's happening. I mean, we've got all kinds of districts. Um, Minneapolis is not coming back to school until April 12th for high school students. So that's inaccurate to say that they're already back, right? So no, none of them are, are, I'm not saying that they're all already back. I'm saying if you look at their website and see their plan, their, their plans are all to return to full in person. And before late, the, today, actually I after never we are, heard that as a plan. I'm just saying after we are, there is no district anywhere that I'm aware of that is planning five days because if they still have kids at home and learning in high school. I'm not aware of any that it has that in place. If you have something different, I'd love to hear about it. I'm just um, saying. I'm not sure, and I'm not sure that that's a point that I care a lot about, whether it's four or five days. I care more about just the general idea of I hybrid think, or in person. Right. What I hear you talking about is the date, right? So you mentioned a whole bunch of, of districts just now, and I'm just letting you know that um, yeah, there, there's some discrepancy to what you just said, right? You, you included some districts that are coming back way later than we are in person. But today was the first time I ever heard we're coming back to full in person, that we have even had any discussion at all. And I'm not even sure that it's clear that we are coming back. Oh. Up until, you know, 15 minutes ago, I thought we were going hybrid. Oh, we are going hybrid to come back in for first. Yes, absolutely. We are coming back in hybrid on, on March 15th. Yep, we are. Yep. 
And most of the districts you're talking about have just announced this week their return dates. So, yep, and we are we are part of that group that's announcing right now because all of a sudden case rates are really dropping. So just to be clear, we are going back to full in person. We are gonna go back four days a week because we still have kids at home. And okay. by the way, every every, every single district that you've mentioned is also going back four days. I don't know of one that isn't. I don't know who you've been talking to, but I've been talking to the superintendents and every single one of them is coming back four days so that they can honor the kids at home and have some time to serve them. Christine, I'm not making the argument that people are coming back for five days. I'm making the argument that they're coming back to full in person and four days is reasonable. I'm not making that argument. Okay, so I guess what's your question? You're upset that we um, didn't announce it sooner. Okay, I hear you. No, you announced it at this meeting. I didn't know anything about it. It's why I asked that this agenda item be added. So, you, but you are announcing officially that we're coming back April 5th to full in person? Absolutely, assuming everything goes well with our, our regional support team, of course. Okay, and do you know what those criteria for everything going well might be? I don't, I don't foresee a reason they would say not to. I will tell you the last time we met with them, they did say not to because our, our rates were very high and we hadn't had very any vaccination. I get CDC says something different, but that's not what they told us. And you are welcome, Michelle, to join that meeting. I will send you an invite. Okay, thanks. Any other questions about okay. that? I do feel like I still need to be clear though. On April 5th, we plan to return to full in-person and you're gonna announce that to the community this week, I'm guessing, or? The timeline is outlined in my slide deck. Yes, that's the goal. I wanna just let you know that I wanna talk to our regional support team beforehand, but yes, that is the goal and all of my secondary principals are aware of that. Okay. And we do meet regularly about these things, by the way. Who meets regularly? The secondary principals and I meet to problem solve every issue we have with hybrid, distance learning, students achieving, attendance dish issues, and all of that as well. And, and the role of the regional support team, again, is uh, so is the regional case, uh, cases per so the guidance from the state is that whenever we make a change in learning model, we're supposed to do so with the approval of our regional support team. Okay. The regional support team includes a representative of Minnesota Department of Education, Minnesota Department of Health, and our local county health. So okay. in our case, that's Ramsey Health and Washington Health. Okay. Okay. So you run it, you run the plan by them and then you're good to go. Right. And one of the things that's been happening around the whole metro is that different regional support teams have been giving different guidance to different districts. I'll be real about that. But I don't foresee an issue with this one. So, Kristen, during these meetings, do you often talk about, oh, I consulted with the other superintendents in the area. What What's their role in that? I, I, I mean, I, it's networking. I understand that. But uh, do they have a, a say in what we implement in our district? Because uh, earlier on, you said that their demographics are different. And so what they implement is not necessarily what you're doing. You, so what's their role? So, I, Of the regional support team? What? What's the role of the regional support team? No, the other superintendents. Every one of them has to have a meeting with the regional support team, but regional support teams are a little bit different depending on which county you're in. Those who are in our counties are have the same exact regional support team. It's the same people. What I'm saying Charlotte. in this meeting, you often refer to, oh, I talked to so-and-so superintendent, so-and-so superintendent, so-and-so superintendent, and we're in agreement. And and I just want to know what's the, what, how do they, fit in this whole decision making? They're advisory, they're advisory. But no, I don't sit in the meeting and talk about other superintendents plans because that those are their plans, not our plan. I go through our district data about our case rates in our schools, our case rates in our athletics, 
our case rates among our staff, and we look at our county level case rates. And that's what we talk about with our regional support teams. So that's what we talk about is the data. We don't talk about other districts. I'm gonna toss it out there just uh, to think about. Um, as I look back over the last couple of months, um, we've got kindergarten and through second grade back to school. We've got third through fifth grade back to school. We're going to get hybrid rolling here in a couple of weeks. And Christine's putting together a plan with uh, the secondary principals to move forward with full, um, full learning for uh, full in person if you uh, so do so choose to do that. Um, that is a steady buildup of going back to school. Um, it's not a quick switch and everybody goes back to school and we're all back there and we're going. Um, we're still in the grips of a pandemic. And if anyone says differently, um, just keep in mind that, I don't know, 500,000 people have died because of this. We're getting vaccinated. Things, great, great things are happening. We've got safe things set up at our schools. But I really want to throw it out there that we still have to keep very careful standards and not flip that switch and, and change things um, 180 degrees like overnight. Um, I, I, I really caution um, pressure to make this happen uh, because we are making steps to come back and we're doing it safely. And the more we push it, the more danger we're gonna surround ourselves with. We need to be very careful and do this very thoughtfully. I appreciate the pressure and it's great to have those conversations, but we really need to be very careful. I keep hearing it all over the place. We as human beings are so, so sick of this pandemic. I'm sick to death of it, but that pandemic is not sick of us. It's gonna find a way to come back. So we really have to be careful. And to look back at what we've done over two short months is pretty incredible. Our elementary schools are back and we're not talking about that. How are they doing? How's that look? But we're rushing and rushing and rushing to get everybody back. We have to be careful. We have to be so, so careful. Thank you. All right, any other comments on the learning model? Okay, if not, next we have superintendent check-in. Can I can I ask for just a one minute bio break? I'm about to, I've been holding back a sneezing attack for like the okay. last five minutes and I feel like I've just got to sneeze and get it out. Give me one second, sure. bio break. I'm new, so I'm gonna break the ice. What's the funnest movie you've seen lately? <laughs> you know, it, it, it has nothing to do with uh, school board business. Something fun. Since we're all sitting here awkwardly. I'm so sorry. I've literally been, I have this like tissue, I was blowing my nose. I'm like, I gotta hold back these sneezes because I'm talking right now. I apologize. <laughs> I was like, oh, I just got to get this out. TMI. 
that's okay. Um, we can wait a minute if people need to come back. I know. Charlotte, you know, I'll tell you, the person I talked to about things like movies is Nancy. <laughs> oh, Nancy just, has good movies? Yeah. Oh. Movies, well, I don't yeah. know. I, you know, I have to say, and this was not a happy movie, but um, HBO has a series about uh, Mia Farrow and Woody Allen. Oh. It's just, it's really, really interesting, you know, how people with all the money in the world can uh, make such terrible <laughs> decisions. <laughs> and, you know, and it's about child abuse. It's really, it's really uh, disturbing. It's disturbing. So if you want to be disturbed, you know. <laughs> okay. Watch that. It's called uh, Alan V. Farrow. Yeah, it's really okay. good. I was going to say, people who have money in the world, I know that when Prince passed away, he did not live a, he did not leave a will. It's like, how could you have all that money and not leave a will? So anyway, terrible decision. Um, for... I'm not sure if Ben's back or not, or actually, or Steve. So maybe I'm back. I them... just Sorry if I created a, a gap. I just... <laughs> It's like before Steve, I forgot for another hour. Yeah, I'm here too. Yep, it looks like Steve's back. So everybody's back, Christine. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that little pause. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so I've got a couple things to talk about. The superintendent update right now. So I want to talk about a few different things. Um, the other issue, since we're on the topic of COVID, I wanted to just bring up the next fun topic, which is uh, the COVID. Hang on, let me share my screen here. The issue that came up last week um, about the COVID quarantine for staff, I mean for, I'm sorry, for athletics. And so I just kind of want to walk through with you, um, you know, why we had not made any shortening of our quarantine in District 62. And I'm going to tell you right now, my recommendation is to continue to keep our quarantine levels at the way they are right now. Of course, you as a board have the ability to direct, direct me otherwise, but I kind of want to walk through a little bit of information because when it came up last week, um, it really wasn't something that was on our agenda. So I hadn't pulled together some data for you and I wanted to share that with you right now. Um, and of course, I did have a meeting um, last week. Michelle was a part of it and Ben was as well. Ben is a member of our COVID response team. So I included him as well to talk with our uh, principals and ADs us, which are our activities directors and uh, our health services department. So I wanna just kind of give a little bit of a timeline. So back in 20, 20, December of this past year, the CDC did uh, modify its guidelines for quarantine, right? So they, um, the, the big reason they did it is because that that 14 day quarantine could impose some personal burdens that could affect physical and mental health as well as economic hardship. So they did offer some additional opportunities for shortened quarantines, but they did outline the risks in doing so. And that's what's highlighted here below. Um, we spent some time, and, and just so I can be clear, like this is not, this was not new. We heard about this in December and we had some internal conversations where we're we gonna shorten our quarantine rates or were we not? But we looked at the guidance that said, they still recommended we stick with the 14 day quarantine if there was a reason not to. And at the time we stuck with the 14 day quarantine because we felt like it was, it was what was showing what was having the best uh, ability to prevent transmission among our, our students. So that's not new that the quarantine is new. There was some, um, before a week before the Minnesota State High School League put out something, I did have our, there were some questions brewing that this was coming up with the Minnesota State High School League. And I, um, I included just a response our, when our health office reached out to the Minnesota Department of Health about it, the question was, so if we were to reduce quarantines, could students still play in games uh, sooner? And the response was, because we had heard some different information. This was dated on the 12th. And um, at the time, this is the response that happened on February 12th, that the Department of Health person, and I personally am leaving names off on purpose because there's been literally death threats that have gone out to some people for different things. So I just wanna be clear about some stuff. 
this, but it's, I have the evidence if somebody wants to know who actually sent this, but the question was sent, should we do this? And, and the response from the Department of Health was, if a shortened quarantine is chosen, players are still required to monitor symptoms and maintain six feet of social distance, which means they basically should not play games until day 15. On February 19th, this new guidance came out from the Department of Minnesota State High School League. This is what this has been referenced and this is part of what came up. So this is the Minnesota State High School League quarantine clarification, February 19th, 2021. And the part I'm gonna show you that's on the slide is this spot right here, the opening statement of this document. The opening statement of this doc, and, and I, I wanna be clear, I'm just telling you this is kind of why we hadn't changed it. I don't, I'm not trying to argue whether people feel differently about, I'm just giving you, this is kind of what went into our background planning. And I did talk with our health office to get some of the background on this. Um, that document that's linked right here, this is the first couple of paragraphs of that document. And you can see it says 14 days is still currently recommended as the safest. There are some different options, seven days without testing or, or 10 days without testing in seven days. It does say that individuals who meet the criteria for a shortened quarantine are still recommended to remain, maintain social distancing by six feet. So this was the Minnesota State High School League guidance that came out in 2019 that was being referenced um, when parents came to speak. We all, and we had a couple of parents last time that came to the board. And by the way, they were very respectful and I give them credit for that because of course there's so much at play when we're talking about our, our kids and their mental health and their well-being. I'm just trying to give you a little background about why we why we hadn't changed our, doc, our guidance. And that's because of some things that we had been given information about. Um, after our board meeting last Tuesday night, the next morning on, or two days later, on February 25th, I was in a meeting with other Metro area superintendents. It was an AMSD meeting with superintendents. And I asked the question, I asked the person in charge if they could put this polling question out there so that I could be clear were we way off base? Were we not following what others were doing? And this is the result that came out of that meeting two days later uh, when we were in our conversation with um, at Metro Area Superintendents. And part of, I think, what the issue is a little bit is that many of the people our teams are playing are in private school sectors. And those private school sectors have basically been in person five days a week through this entire pandemic. And they have not been in a sense, under the same direction and guidelines of regional support teams in metro area, I mean, um, the Department of Education in the same way. And I'll just say that's really clear because I've talked to many parents recently who are upset and the school, schools they talk about are not our um, neighboring districts. They are, they are neighboring um, private schools, but they're not public school districts. That said, there are public school districts in our East Metro Conference who are in this category one of which in our East Metro Conference is a public school district that is doing seven days. And I'm very well aware of that as well. But what I wanted to do was get a sense, like, are we way off base? Is my health office really off base with what they're looking at? We had a meeting to kind of look at some of this data together. Um, earlier today, there was another communication that just came to us from a regional support team member that they are gonna reissue some recommendations from a 14 day quarantine for athletics. And they also lumped in the out of state travel for staff and students. Um, and this is that this came in an email from a regional support team member today. So I'm just trying to give you an example of some of the different places we're trying to get our guidance from. We're not trying to be heartless with um, families. I know our hockey team has been really impacted by this quarantine. If you saw the newspaper recently, uh, it's been really hard, especially when they play against a team and there were members of that team who were playing actively with COVID symptoms and that really affected our hockey team in terms of, of um, their quarantine. A couple things else that have come from our region, I mean, our health office. So this, this comes from CDC, the 14 day transmission risk is less than 1% if you quarantine for 14 days. If reduced to a 10 day quarantine, the risk goes to one to 10%. If you reduce to a seven day, it goes from five to 12%. In 62, that could be, could be based on our current data, 27 additional cases in athletics and 42 additional cases in in-person. There's some information I want everybody to just be aware of and it's something we also take into consideration, uh, COVID risk complications by race. Um, there's some information here from both Ramsey and Washington County as well. Um, 
in our district, uh, these are the data about our positive cases. So, so far we've had 91 students of color test positive for COVID and we've had 57 that we know of. In February, we had five positive athletics cases and 46 close contacts because of it. One of those cases led to three other of those close contacts testing positive for COVID. And that leads to why you have more close contacts, of course. We had four positive students who attended in-person learning, 64 close contacts, and none of those close contacts got symptoms or positive COVID results at following that situation. So what we know is that in athletics, we are having greater positivity rates. We are seeing more COVID transmission happening in athletics than we are in um, in in-person learning. And I'll just come back to the point where it's, it's really hard. This has been a really discuss, difficult discussion. Um, these are some of the factors that have gone in. I heard you mention earlier, Nancy David Law, I talked to him at, at length, he's the largest school district and they're absolutely not budging on their 14 day rule. Um, and so I want to just be clear that like what, when we talk about, because they've also been told the same data and it's about as a school district, if you wanna shorten the guidelines, then you are assuming the risk for doing so. Um, and so I'm not really here to try to convince you. I'm only here to try to show you why we haven't shortened our guidelines or our rule. Um, of course, as a school board, you have the right to overrule me and that's in your power to do so. I just want you to understand the rationale that's gone into it. It's not about trying to harm children or um, it's about the guidance we've been given from, from the health department, from our local officials, from othering districts. And, and, and yes, I've, I've talked to a lot of parents recently. And most of the time when I'm talking to them, they're talking about Hill Murray and Breck and other schools, Benilde St. Margaret, who are private schools and how they're not doing the same, following the same guidelines. Um, our local districts, the other big issue that's come up among our team is we could shorten this for athletics and not for academics. But I think we have to really have an honest conversation. Are we gonna be having different standards for, uh, for athletics versus academics? And if so, then that would make a lot more sense to me than something we're gonna do differently for athletics. And I had some follow-up conversations after my last meeting because I know some people were not speaking freely about how they felt they wanted to identify the issue. And so I've been trying to get a sense of where people are really at. And by people, I mean, our leaders of our buildings, our ADs. Um, I've had, I just talked to a parent yesterday who was very clear that, was trying to articulate that, but no child in our district has gotten sick with COVID or hospitalized. And, and that's not true at all. I mean, we, we don't get the data on every child that's hospitalized, but anecdotally, we know of several uh, hospitalizations that have happened with parents and with students. And so um, I just want you to understand the rationale on our end. There's, incredibly angry emails about this coming from all sides. But I just want you to understand for me as a superintendent, the things I've been weighing and looking at and the data I've been looking at, and these are the pieces that have been influencing my decision. And it is not new guidelines. The, state, the guidelines to shorten quarantines came out in December. They didn't come out in February. Um, we didn't shorten guidelines in December when that first happened. Um, and so I feel like that's been a big part of why we've been able to keep our students and staff really healthy. And that's just kind of my position on it. I think we've come a really long way with this pandemic. I think we're, we're really closing in on some success with the pandemic, but I don't feel now is the time to let our guard down and have a different approach. We hear a lot about variants that are out there. I know of several people who are sick right now I don't believe this is the time to let it let our guard down and that's just kind of where I'm coming from. So I am gonna leave it to you to tell me if you feel like as a board, I have to do something differently with this decision. All right, any questions or comments on that one? I think kind of, I think going off of what Ben had said earlier that we've had a lot of success of bringing students back into the classroom and it's going well. And, you know, Christine, with you saying the variants and there's still, you know, people are still getting the virus and they're having all different types of 
experiences with it that I think it is really important that we're vigilant in how we approach both quarantine with our athletics and academics, because we don't want to turn up the dial, as they say, and then we have to take five steps back and kind of start over. We want to try to get all of our, you know, students and parents in a spot where they feel comfortable with participating in athletics and academics. And I think you providing the information to us uh, gives us some clarity of the different sources that you have reached out to or that you have been receiving information from, because it goes to show it isn't the same information from the same source. You're, you know, you're getting it from all different directions and it's a little bit different and you have to try to come up with what is the best solution for our district based on the rest of the directors and a principal. So I do appreciate the diligence that's going into trying to come up with these decisions. Thank you. It's not easy and there's people angry. And I've had this conversation with several parents, by the way, and and I'll give them this. The parents I've talked to are, have been very respectful, uh, very passionate, but also understanding that this is really complicated and, and I have to look at all these data points and try to make the best recommendation I can make as a leader. And I know there are going to be people continually very angry about this. And I'm I'm willing to stand up for that because I don't feel comfortable changing our guidance at this time. Trust me. I have, I get a, question. Mm-hmm. I have a question. Uh, so most of the... Uh, um, feedback or input that we've received were from some healthcare uh, staff in our district. And I'm wondering if uh, um, there are other messages that we could send out to, you know, like what you just explained to um, explain. I'm, not, I'm personally, I'm not a healthcare provider, so I, I, you know, I, I, I can't speak to that. But I'm wondering if, uh, if, because um, there are healthcare providers in our field, and none of I, from my perspective, anyway, none of us in this room are healthcare providers. So we need to be able to listen to them as well. So I'm wondering if there is any other messaging that we could do. Um. Well, I'll tell you, any parent who has questioned why, who, and I've had calls, plenty of calls from parents that I've These are not to. parents, though. These are, these are health care providers in our district. Our health care, our health care providers are getting their guidance from the state health department. So, yeah. yeah but there, I, some of them have been emailing us. That's because yeah. they're, they want to make sure that they ha- our nurses, yes, you're right. Our nurses have been very concerned that our board is gonna overturn my recommendation. And that's why they've been emailing you. And there have been athletic parents emailing you trying to make sure that you do overturn my recommendation because there's different needs and questions involved, right? So uh, I wanna say though very clearly, I'm not responding just because our own employees are saying this isn't what's working. I'm, I'm responding based on the data I've gotten from the Department of Health. Um, I have I have communicated with our our own you mean our own school nurses yes and they there are school nurses feel very passionate and I just want to explain like in our district our school nurses the way it works is whenever somebody contracts COVID who's a student our school nurses are the contact tracers so they're the ones who have to call the family find out who else has had contact and so they spend a lot of time contact tracing if it's an employee who catches COVID and and no, notifies us. Then we have some district level contact tracers who end up being the ones tracking down which people that employee had contact with and who might be close contacts. So our, our, our nursing staff, which are largely LPNs, are kind of on the front lines. They have to call parents and say, hey, your child's gonna be quarantined for X number of days because your child is identified as a close contact or they have to call the parent or they have to call the family of a child who has COVID and say, could you tell us would you be willing to? They don't have to. Would you be willing to tell us who were who were people who were close to your child? Um, and then they end up on the front line. So I think part of what you've been hearing from some of our nurses is that they've been on the front lines of those conversations and they just 
they feel like all of that work they've been doing is really important and they don't want to see that quarantine rate day shortened. And I think that's what you've probably been hearing from nurses. And families have very big concerns that their children are um, really suffering from not being connected to other peers, that they're suffering from the mental health issues of not being connected with others, the athletics, especially if you're a senior and this is your year to really shine in your athletic area, especially if you're looking for, you know, scholarships for college and what have you, it's very passionate and it's very real. And it's not, it's not, I mean, it's legitimate, all of it is. Um, and I've heard it from both sides as you have too. You've gotten some communication from both sides for sure. Um, I get it all day, every day from all sides. And I just want you to know that like, it's not an easy decision to make. So what we try to do is really look at what does the recommendation from the CDC say? What is the recommendation from the Minnesota Department of Health say? And then what does our own data show? And so those are kind of the areas we've looked at. That's what I tried to share with you tonight. And those are the things that have influenced my recommendation not to make a change here. And there are, there are some other places that have made changes, in particular private schools that are not following the 14 days, they've shortened it. And the CDC and the health department says they can do so. I'm just saying, I've looked at their, their guidance is in bold says, but it's not recommended. And that's where I'm trying to come from. So yeah, I, I hear you, Charlotte though. And, and you've been hearing from our nurses. They are pretty passionate about it. But I just wanna be clear, I'm not just swayed because our own nurses are saying it, I've been trying to look at the data. I kind of look at it sort of from the perspective as a board member, kind of from the perspective that we have developed a process uh, for transparency and following the data in, in our board decision-making process. And I would be really disappointed if the board's decision was to say, well, in this case, we're going to not listen to any of the data. We don't care what kind of a process we've been through it's our decision, the kids are gonna go back to school and there's gonna be no distancing, there's going to be no quarantining for athletics and everything's gonna go back to normal because we've decided not to listen to the data. We're not going to watch the science. We're not going to pay any attention to what's going on. Um, it just seems to me that as a board, we've developed a strong commitment to data and the process of how to interpret and use that data. And I don't think that this is the time when we should stop doing that. You know what, I, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, with all due respect, Steve, I, I personally think that uh, staff and parents' input is also data that we should uh, we, we should take seriously. So uh, that's, yeah, anyway, that, that, that's all I'm gonna say about that, that uh, input that we get is also data, so. Um. I, I do want to say something. So I do feel like the I can support, you know, maintaining the 14 day quarantine. However, um, you know, to address the question, I've never heard anybody on our board suggest that we should put our students or our staff at risk or that we should ignore the guidance from CDC. The guidance from CDC gives the option of 14 and gives the option of seven. So it's a gray area. It's an area where you have discretion and it's, you know, to call, to call you out as kind of a science denier, if you suggest following, um, uh, you know, one view of the CDC guidance instead of the other, I don't think is appropriate. Our parents who have their kids in athletics right now, they're not science deniers. They're no, not I trying wouldn't think they are. Like there's, no, they're not trying to pretend like there's no risk. Um, they actually, you know, according to the CDC and MDH, there's a tolerable level of risk that many families choose to take. You know, some families choose not to take that. But when we talk about these hockey kids, and there was a Star Tribune article, I don't know if you saw it, 
but it was addressing this, you know, our kids. Our district our girls, being infected by another school, yes. Yes, being affected by another school and then that school, a private school, you know, it's on, in Star Tribune, it's not secret, but it's Hill Murray, three kids playing. Um, so they're going to quarantine their girls for seven days. And then there's another team, I think it was Breck, is going to quarantine their kids for zero days. And then we're going to quarantine our kids for 14 days. I don't think that, you, you know, I'm, I can do the 14 days because it is consistent with the guidance and it is what Christine said but as a sports parent myself my kids are playing sports and I'm not trying to kill anyone I'm not trying to de deny science I am trying to give my kids a healthy social experience that they thrive in that they benefit from my kids played on teams where kids on the team got COVID and yeah it's you know everyone's scared of COVID but um there's a tolerable level of risk. And I think families make that choice, especially in an environment where they're in online school and they're just going with this group of their peers who are making a choice to play. You know, it's not like they're forced to come into a classroom. And I just feel like this is not just, you know, science denial. This is a legitimate request by the school board that we adopt the seven day quarantine. So the now, school the board? District, I do not, I'm not the school board. We are the school board. And if the school board and Christine, if you guys determine that we prefer the 14 day more conservative approach, or like Steve said, we use, um, you know, where we support whatever the superintendent says, I'm comfortable with that, but I just don't really like the position that it's a crazy request. It's not. It's very I, reasonable. I want to just. I want to. I want the opportunity to respond to that. I have never thought that's a crazy request. I will uh, counter what you said about the CDC presents these as just choices. The CDC presents the option and says, "But we recommend 14." The Minnesota Department of Health doesn't just say these are choices. They recommend 14. So I just want to be clear about that. Christine, there's a specific section on sports that you did not show that does say the seven day quarantine. So I just feel like the nitty gritty of debating the policy maybe isn't the best use of our time. And I'm here to tell you, we have called the Department of Health and we have called our regional support team and we've gotten these pieces of guidance. You as a board get to override it. As you are saying, if the school board is making a recommendation to go for seven days, then the school board can make that decision. I'm just giving you my recommendation as a superintendent and I'm giving you the reasons why I'm making that recommendation. Trust me, I've had lots of conversations with parents that don't believe they're science deniers. And many of the conversations I've had with parents are very much passionate, but they're not bad people. People have all kinds of perceptions, right? Perceptions that we've never had a kid in 622 get sick or be hospitalized. That's not true at all, right? But, but that's not public data. We don't get to share public data and we don't even know who all has been sick. I can tell you anecdotally, I know of multiple people who've been hospitalized, some who are still in very serious conditions because of COVID. So, but there, there is a perception that that doesn't happen, um, that it's just like, I, I'm just saying, I'm not here to debate that this is a real conversation to be had. I'm not even here to say that other districts in particular private schools haven't already adopted this, but but I'm here to tell you as a school board, you're saying the school board is making this recommendation, then the school board gets to decide. I'm just giving you my recommendation and the reason I'm making it based on the, the conversations I've had with the Department of Health and our regional support teams and our, our regional people and looking at our own district data. It's not because I care about some others more than others. It's not because I've never, and I would imagine many of my staff could tell you, I have no problem telling our staff when you've crossed the line and we're out of line here, this is not okay. The fact that you have heard from some staff, particularly school nurses, okay, they have some passion about them. I didn't tell our school nurses to call you. I didn't call them up and say, hey, you should be calling the board right now. I certainly did not. I don't know if you've noticed, there's more people watching our board meetings lately because of COVID than ever before. People watch a board meeting and they talk to each other and they have opinions. And that's part of being a public meeting, right? That's gonna happen. I'm just giving you my example of 
of my recommendation. And, and like I said, I went after that meeting last week, I immediately went to our Metro Area Superintendent meeting and said, hey, could you make sure this poll question gets asked? Because I don't want to, I mean, if everybody else has changed their guidance, I'd like to know because I, this is what we've been told from the Department of Health. So, but right. I, so I don't, I, I, I've never said any parents are doubting science. I've talked to plenty of parents myself and I think they've been passionate and reasonable and none of them have been science doubters. Never, ever have I said that, nor do I believe that at all. I think people are very passionate about their kids' well-being, and every one of us would fight tooth and nail for our kids. The problem is, the challenge is, we have to, I have to think about 11,000 students. Even when I was a superintendent, my first three years in this school district, I had a child who was also at Tartan High School. I had a child who questioned my own decisions left and right. She put me on blast for things I thought about, but I had an obligation to not think about my kid only. Of course, I'm going to always think about my kid, but I had an obligation to think about all of our students. And that's something that I had to do when I was wearing that hat. And, and I had to have that conversation many times with my own kids about when I'm thinking about the system or policies I have to think about or, or reactions to a whole system. I can have conversations about you and your situation, but I have to, I have, a, I have a challenge right now that I have to think about the whole system and I have to think about everybody else's kids. And this is the data that I've used to make a recommendation. And so by all means, you've heard from our own recent board retreat. I am your one employee. You are, you get to govern what I say and do. And if you want to override my decision or recommendation, you get to do that. I'm just giving you the rationale for why I'm making the recommendation I'm making. And I'd I'm like to the data. I'd like, to, Sorry. I'd like to respond for just a second too, to make sure that my position is not misunderstood. Um, the board knows that I have not been shy about saying that we should be very careful about reopening the schools. The, um, but the issue with what we're talking about is larger than just the kids who play athletics when it comes to the quarantine. One of the problems with community spread is that COVID can be carried and spread by people without them even knowing they're carrying and spreading it. And that's why we do contact tracing. What if some, some one of our, of our kids who doesn't quarantine long enough, then, then happens to give it to his grandma and she dies. Nobody knows for sure where she contacted it, maybe, because she might be out in public, you know, putting herself at risk all the time. But the problem with COVID and the reason the quarantine numbers are the way they are is because that's the best way to control community spread. And I think that especially in athletics, where the risk of exposure is greater because of the close contact and by the nature, the very nature of, of athletic activity, it just seems to me that we should always keep in mind that this is a community spread problem. It's not just the problem of whether or not my student athlete will get sick because they played with somebody from Hill Murray who had COVID. Um, I, I firmly believe that all of our kids should be back to school 100%. They should be back to playing sports. They should be doing everything else. The problem is we don't have complete control over community spread yet. And I think we have to be especially careful. And I think that that is what I mean when I say we should follow the science and make sure that we are as conservative as we need to be to make sure that our community stays as healthy as possible. All right, anything else on this topic? I, I concur with what Steve just said. I also am a parent of uh, the kids that did did participate in, in sports quite a bit. And I know the contact that goes on within sports, especially within high schoolers and all that. 
And uh, I concur that we need to follow the science and, and adhere to that, uh, the CDC guidelines and all that. So I, yeah. All right, thanks, Charlotte. Anyone else? I go back to a slide from way back in August that we had where safety needs to be our number one concern. So again, what Steve was saying is really spot on in this situation. Okay, thanks, Ben. All right, ne oh no, Christine, you're still on your update. No, I just had a couple of quick things. I wanted to just mention that um, I had, I wanted to make a mention of online learning. So uh, we know that we've got a number of families that are choosing distance learning. We talked about that earlier today. And we have been talking among our principal group of, of pulling together some focus groups to hear from our families, to really kind of understand um, more about their choices. There's, there's a wondering out there that we have, to what extent is this COVID related? To what extent is it other employment schedule related? And to what extent is it race related? Um, we have a wondering about students who are experiencing microaggressions in the classroom. And are there things that are part of their experience that makes it safer and more comfortable to be in online learning? What are some things that we've learned what, what could we learn from it? And I don't wanna plant any ideas, but we do wanna have a little bit of a conversation about, tell us more about why you're choosing distance learning. One of the things we're he seeing is we've got a number of families who are choosing um, online learning permanently. They are looking for schools for next year. We've had a lot of even elementary age students who are coming to our open houses or talking about registration for next year, asking, are you gonna to continue to offer the online options? Now, you know, we were already working on our, our high school schedule for online school. Um, and what we've decided in, in, in finding with our neighboring districts around us as well, most are planning to, we already submitted our application to become online providers for next year permanently anyway. We were already working on that before COVID. Um, and what we're learning is that everybody else is too and everybody else is doing it for K-12. So we're gonna be putting out some information to families just to see how many would be interested if this option were to continue? And then how do we build out a really amazing uh, online school at grades K-12? Because we know that prior to COVID, we already had over 200 students who were enrolled in our, who lived in our district, who open enrolled to an online charter school. Um, right now we have over 200 students who are homeschooled and we would love to see them connected to a classroom opportunity. If they're gonna be at home and learning at home, would they, would they be interested in an online school that could allow them to be part of a regular class, regular community rather than uh, going it alone? So we're doing some data collection right now. We already did some initial surveying with that. And I want you to know that that is moving forward. And we are definitely looking at expanding that option for next year in grades K-12, not just high school, like we were originally planning based on what we're finding from our data and what our families are asking for. So just want you to put that on, that rate, on your radar. I also want to, one other quick announcement. We talked about immersion programs um, earlier this year about how we're trying to explore the idea of how many of our families would be interested in world language immersion programs. And, and I talked to you about my whole many, two decades building immersion programs. So um, wanting to just get a sense of how much our community is interested in that. And we did do a survey with our younger students and I'll send some data out to you with it. We looked at families and ages, birth with, with students birth to age, for to see what they would think about immersion programming and if that would be something they would be drawn to. We also are trying to look at students who have left our district, who live in our district, if that's part of the reason they've left is because they went looking for an immersion opportunity. So we're pulling that data together. I just want you to keep it on your radar. We haven't dropped that conversation. We are moving forward with it, but I will have some updated data for you in the very near future as well, just kind of keeping that in on, on our radar as well. So those are the other two pieces I wanted to share with you. Great, any questions or comments? I might have missed this. Is this something that might happen in as soon as the fall? No, okay. the, the online programming, yes, as soon as the fall. Because we have families that are saying they wanna continue that right now out of distance learning, they wanna stay in it for next year. Okay. And we've got a number of families asking for it right now, which. We were already, we've been growing our online options at, a, a sec, at high school for quite a while now, but this, it's a new demand coming about from our elementary and middles, but 
we do have some teachers who become quite experts in that business. And so we're looking at trying to offer, um, you know, to see if there are family, to what extent are families really interested in those grade levels. And we do have some teachers who've been really amazing at that job. So trying to look at how to piece that together. So yes, it is for fall. Immersion, no, that would be in the future, at least a couple of years out. We're just trying to get a sense of what the interest is if we were to go in that route. Would teachers, uh, teachers wouldn't be expected to do, like these would be separate teachers from in class, uh, in person teachers, just kind of doing a straight up online thing. Wouldn't look for like sure at the elementary level. and middle. Okay, for cool. sure at the elementary and middle, because the elementary and middle both require supervision. Now at our high school, this is this is not new this year, but we have we've had some online options for a while now. But at the high school, we have had kids who like they take of their six hours, one of them's an online class. And that's part of why our media center at the high school needs to be a really amazing place that feels a little bit more like a college uh, commons area because we wanna be able to offer, hey, if your fourth hour is an online class, you can go there and be participating. But um, so at high school, a student could be in both worlds. At middle and elementary, we would probably have them be in one world or the other so they could be part of a, a defined class. And Christine, and I think in the past you've talked about the fact that uh, both Tartan and North will be able to collaborate and have joint uh, faculty that are teaching the same course too through online. Yeah, we, we actually have that right now. We spent, Josh can attest to this, we spent several hours in a meeting recently looking at like of all the courses offered between both high school principals, who's, how many kids signed up from each side and, and is it going to be a Tartan teacher or a North teacher that's going to teach it based on the numbers? And yeah, it's very... Very intricate work, but yes, Charlotte, that's exactly right. Having it be taught by both staff, students could be attending both, but you know, you may take a class that maybe if it had been alone at Tartan, it would have had to be canceled because not enough Tartan kids signed up for it. But if both schools signed up for it, there's enough enrollment to keep it going. And that would be really great because we could offer more course options for kids than by having that availability. So exactly what you just said. And, and our dream one day would be, rather than having a Tartan course catalog and a North one, to have a 622 course catalog and have some dis, you know, descriptions about what are gonna be Tartan in person and what are North in person, but like what are gonna be open to all students. So we're getting there. It's been quite a progress this year, amazing progress this year. And I'll have an update at a, at a upcoming board me meeting for you all about the number of courses we've been able to expand upon because of this online and blended learning opportunity. So I've got some really cool data emerging right now that can give you some, some more info, a, a better picture of how many kids are partaking in those programs. Okay, anything else? I was just gonna say one more thing, just so you guys know, right now kids are still enrolling or changing their classes for next year. So that's why it's not complete data yet, but it will be soon. All right, I got logged out of board book somehow. Oh, there I go, okay. Um, so I think next, are, anything else, Christine, or any other questions for Christine? Okay. Then I got logged out of board book, it's logging back in, but I think the next agenda item is board check-in. Is that right? That's correct, board check-in. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so board check-in, anyone wanna start? Hey, it's Ben. Anyone wanna start? Oh, Ben, you wanna start? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I like we had a meeting uh, right before Thanksgiving break. It was the last day of the first trimester. Um, big milestone. Today is the last day of the second trimester. Uh, another big milestone. So um, I just wanted to call that out. And, uh, you know, we're proud of the work that the students are doing. We're proud of the work that our community is doing and we're proud of the work the teachers are doing. So um, uh, one more, one more trimester to go. Thanks, Ben. Um, Nancy? Well, I'm very encouraged by the progress of the staff getting vaccinated. I mean, um, you know, the fact that 
more than half. What nine? Was it 964 out of 1700? Um, so that's just awesome. That's just awesome. And uh, I got my shot today, and I have to say, it gives you just this little thrill because, you know, we're bombarded with paranoia about, you know, the horrors of COVID. And, you know, uh, to feel protected is a wonderful thing. Um, so I'm, you know, and, uh, I know we're being conservative, um, in our approach, uh, but kids have their whole life to live. You know, they have their whole life to live. I hate limiting opportunities, hate, hate, hate limiting opportunities, but they have their whole life to live. We have to keep them healthy and safe. Um, I so admire our teachers for, uh, going back to the classroom with their masks and their shields and whatever, I, you know, I mean, I know they're scared, um, but um, uh, I think that, you know, the precautions are in place. Um, we've been really conservative. I think, I think it's gonna, it's gonna work out. So, uh, so that's all. Thank, thank you to everyone for, for all that you're doing. I know it's just been a, a really rough time, but I think the winter is behind us. I really do. I really do. I think spring is around the corner. You know, we're going to be okay. So. All right. Thanks, Nancy. Um, uh, Steve, do you have anything? Um, Julia, do you have anything? I don't have anything tonight. Okay, thanks. Uh, Charlotte? Yeah, so I, I attended the um, page amendment uh, focus group last week and it went really well and uh, it was very well attended and we had really great input. I think that MSBA is going to use toward uh, whatever position they take about that amendment. And I also attended over the weekend, I attended a uh, Minnesota School Board of Color and Indigenous uh, folks. Um, and uh, we had the Attorney General, uh, Keith Ellison came and he talked about Cruz Guzman uh, versus the state of Minnesota. And uh, so he gave us an update about that. And the relevancy is that even though Minneapolis and uh, St. Paul schools are the ones that are suing the state of Minnesota, the outcome is going to affect the whole state of Minnesota. So, uh, so he gave us an update on that. So that was um, good. So that, that's my update. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, Christine, did you want to say one more thing? I did. Thank you so much. I, I, I texted Michelle, but hopefully I want to get this squeezed in there. But um, it is newly announced that our president of our teachers union, Rory Sanders, is going to be retiring this year. And um, I know he's watching right now. And I just want to put it out there that he has been um, amazing to work with. And um, we've had definitely hard conflicts over the years, but amazing collaboration that I think is pretty unique among school districts. And um, I know he would say the same thing. And I know he's not able to speak to you right now, although he's texting me right now. So I know he's watching. Um, but he's not only retiring early, uh, this year, but he's also going to be retiring early this year. So this month. So I just wanted to put that out there to you. Um, that's new information for our district this week. Um, but it's uh, definitely a person who's done amazing leadership for our school district. And I know for me personally, um, we've had a lot of, lot of uh, challenging times, but we've learned a lot from each other and he's just been a real gem to work for, work with. So I think he would say the same of me. And I, and I know we've, we've actually talked to other school districts about that collaboration, what it can look like and, and feel like. So just wanted to put that out there, um, reach out to him and thank him for his service with us. 
All right. Thanks, Christine. And Rory, thank you. We know you're watching. <laughs> um, okay, I have a couple. Did I get everyone, Steve? I didn't. Can I check in with you again? Do you want to give us an update? Okay, then I think we got everyone. Um, I just really quick want to tell you guys on Friday, um, I know Nancy's on the AMSD. Um, she's our representative for AMSD, <laughs> excuse me, but they have a meeting 7.30 to 9 this Friday and all board members can attend. Um, and then there's also, I talked a bit about the coffees and conversation from MSBA. And the thing, again, that I really liked about that is that it's a very informal conversation where school board members just discuss, um, you know, what issues are happening around your district. What do you guys think about this and that? So I really enjoyed the last conversation. I went to 10 to 10.55 and, um, you know, it's on their website or Kim can always help us with stuff like that. Um, and then the last thing is every Friday, MSBA does a legislative update from 9 to 9.30 and they just do a super quick run through of everything that happened that week. And there's just one person really who speaks and she just throws all that information at you. It's interesting, you know, it's a lot to take in, but it's nice to hear it. There's some repetition. So you start to get used to what the topics are. And then just one thing I just want to say to the board and Christine as well is I think it's really difficult in this Zoom format to have study sessions like we used to have study sessions because we used to be able to have conversations, you know, at the district education center where we weren't on video, we weren't being recorded. Um, you know, it wasn't being watched by who knows who. And I think it it provided a more informal and more comfortable environment. And, you know, I do not enjoy contentious conversations. It's not what I come here to do. But I also kind of feel like it's my responsibility to ask questions that people in the community are asking. So I am not trying to be that person, but I feel like I need to be that person. So um, with that, if anybody has any other comments, otherwise we can adjourn. We are at adjourn, right, Kim? Because my board book didn't come back up. Or do I need yes, to tell? We can adjourn if everyone's yeah. at the time. We can adjourn seven. Okay. Th